The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this my God. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 131. My name is Gav. And I'm Dan. Welcome, boys, girls, <laughs> ghouls, beasts. Spooks, ghouls, goblins, monsters, creatures, and moon beasts. Moon beasts. Moon beasts. <laughs> welcome. Uh, this is your first time. Uh, uh, my name is Gav. And I'm Dan. And we, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are your hosts, and we are going to talk about a couple of horror films, and it's a special one, this episode, if you don't know of it, and if you do know of it, if you're a regular, and especially if you're a Patreon, because you're Ooh. in the circle, you know what's going on here. But Dan, why is this a special episode? So, for uh, anyone who doesn't know, for those of you that do a little reminder, every three episodes, we are doing something called Patrons Pick, which is where one of our beautiful patrons, our sexy patrons, gets to pick the movies that we are reviewing, the horror movies or the slightly horror movies or whatever it is, as long as they're in that vein. And uh, this episode, for 131, is a big shout out to our patron, Don Collier. What up, Don? Thank you, Don, for this. Uh good choices good choices yeah Don has off the bat and you'll already know this because of the thumbnail as Gav always says but off the bat let's get this out of the way we are covering two big boys uh, one old and one new mm. one of them you will know very well we are talking Poltergeist yep the classic Toby Hooper <clears throat> we've Come never on. covered it in 10 years of podcasting which is always weird. Every time we put, pull a, a classic film to a cover and we haven't covered it, I'm like, are you sure we haven't covered this? <laughs> are you sure? It's like, you know, we've done 131, so it's like 260, and then the odd other one, bits and bobs of patrons here and there. So we've run, done about 270, 280 films we've reviewed. So oh, it's, I can tell you, actually, if you want. So it's kind of weird that um, I feel like we've done most of the majority of the main ones especially poltergeist god it's fucking it's poltergeist it brings such good memories to me um from my childhood which we will speak about then and we are also going to be covering the other choice from don is hereditary, the yes. modern day classic hereditary from 2018 uh, by the way we were together when we first watched that that is true. By the way, this will be our 265th and 266th film that we've reviewed. Wow. 266 in total. So that is why sometimes I forget what we've done and stuff. Which is fair enough. I've got a spreadsheet and I'm very organised because I'm a nerd. Paul in memory, and that's why Dan does that stuff. That's absolutely fine. So thank you so much, Don. First of all, Don sent in an email, which we'll get to in a moment. Don, I hope you don't mind. I've broken your email up. I'm going to read out the hello part, as it were, in a minute. Uh, and then when we get into each of the films, I'm going to send. I'm going to read out your little take on the movie. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll go from there. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But yeah, that's what we're doing for this episode. Very, very exciting stuff. Two films I've got a lot to say about. I uh, can't wait to talk about them. And they're both about sort of families dealing with loss and grief um, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, all good stuff. Uh, what what well, superpower would you have if you could choose one? Invisibility. Is that because you look like a bit of a perv in that? No, I just think um, it'd be really cool to just sort of feel so free. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Either that or teleportation. How far can you teleport? Well... Only on this gives planet, me the power. or can you I've, go to the moon if you had the gear? You're, you're no, I, I think, I think it'd be like if you've been like Nightcrawler from the X Men. He can teleport to somewhere that he's been or that he's seen. He can see. So well, if that's I crap, well, if you haven't got enough money, you never, you never go out on holiday anywhere or anything. Yeah, but you, 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 just, you might. You've never been anywhere. 
but you might end up filled for experimenting yourself like if you teleport somewhere you might end up halfway through a wall or something so you've got to kind of know where you're going yeah do you know what I mean what about you do I just do not not sure flying I think maybe flying would be quite cool but there quite seems flying but, would be good. but once you've done it you've done it so now now I've just got what and but what is it do my arms just flap super hard in the air or do, I think, do like I have like transformer wings that pop out from my arms What's I going think on? You, you have special farts that you can just do. <laughs> you, you do them at will. Do I, do I float upwards just like I'm sitting on a toilet or flying through the air? Yeah, and then you fly along and then you stop, just stop waving guffing down at once people you land. Like the Queen. But think how much petrol money you'd save. Um, yeah. You could fly to work, you know, you could fly. I can't carry all my stuff and shit. Though. Oh, that's true, yeah. But you could still fly places and you could fly over and see me anytime you want. With my new turntables, the digital is a smaller unit, I could place them on top of my unit and I could sit there flying through the air just as a DJ. People think I'm like the second coming as a DJ. <laughs> the flying di- Oh my God, G- Jesus is a DJ. Look up in the sky. He's wearing a Wu-Tang Clan hoodie. I knew it. Wear a wig and shit. Um, what have you been up to? Well, I have been it. I've been very ill, actually. Again, bloody hell! Uh, and normally, when I'm very ill, I try and lie on the sofa and catch up on TV. But I couldn't do that because I was so ill. But once I got out of bed, there was one TV show I got and managed to sit down and watch over two or three nights. And everybody's watching this one at the moment. Sorry, you were ill. That's okay. Not a problem. I'm all, I'm all right now. Um, everybody seems to be watching this show at the moment. It's getting a lot of thumbs up. It's getting a lot of um, can't wait for season two, which has already been greenlit. And I'm talking Tim Burton's Wednesday on Netflix. Um, I sat down to watch this with the knowledge that the girl in it, Jenny Ortega, playing Wednesday was apparently very good. I was excited to see Catherine Zeta-Jones as Morticia. Um, I didn't know much more about the plot, what they were going to do with it. My 10-year-old niece had watched it and loved it. Now, I've got to say, I'm very shocked about that because the first couple of episodes are extremely gory um, and some of the dead bodies in it lying around with heads ripped off and necks snapped and bones sticking out. I thought, not sure she should have watched this. But yeah, Wednesday, uh, all eight episodes, nailed them over about the course of about three nights, really enjoyed it. It's like a bit of a dream for me for Tim Burton to direct. It's not Adam's family, obviously, although they are all in it. Um those were the strongest parts for me is when all the family were in it a lot of the time she's off at her school um trying to like not make friends with people and just be really mean to people and i've got to say the second best character in it is thing um the hand he is amazing in it and steals the show quite a lot of times uh, it keeps flipping people off uh he speaks in sign language occasionally which is really a cool take on the character as well very cool really loved it highly recommended it it's not not going to be for everybody um and i hear a lot of people say it's it's a bit like a dark harry potter because she's in a school and there's a faction of werewolves a faction of vampires etc etc but it's it's very good and i really enjoyed it and um it's got tim burton all over it good stuff good performances great gory effects that's the main thing the one and only thing really that i've been up watching really okay You've been playing a board game. I've been playing Jaws board game. Sarah, my dearest, bought me uh, for my birthday. Uh, the board game, um, played it for her, and I have played it a, a, a loosely, kind of slightly made up, kind of sticking to game with Elijah. Oh, um, bless him. And he was a shark, and he basically ate most of the people on the beaches. And I, didn't, I was like, we're not playing this right. But, you know, um, yeah, that's cool. We're doing that. Um, I watched Donnie Darko with Jay the other night. Um, I kept saying, Jay, no, I'm going to get Donnie Darko on Blu-ray. So I forgot I'd lend it to Sarah. And I thought I'd lost it. And um, watched it again. I haven't seen it for a long time. Man, right at the end, fucking cried my eyes out. Didn't do the sob. I have done the sob before. In one movie, I did the... <laughs> you know, the, the bit where you can't yeah. breathe properly because you're crying so much. I've only ever done that really once, and that is that Ewan McGregor movie where his family get uh, separated with a tidal wave. Gets oh, yeah. Like Asia or something like that. That shit made me fucking like, oh, my God. <laughs> what are you doing to me? He's like, why am I watching this? You know? Um, but, yeah, Donnie Darko at the end of that, I really, like, had a fucking cry. I was like, oh, my God. And it was... um. 
it was kindness again. You know, I said before, kindness. I feel like it's the purest uh, form of, like, you know, happiness. Yeah, I know what you mean. And it was kindness, because he, he was kind enough to go, all right, I'll go, I'll kill myself so um, she can live, that girl that he meets. And he's just like, oh, my God. Yeah. E even though the nonce still carries on to be noncey. Patrick Swayze. Yeah, he's left, left there crying on his bed. Good cast of that, isn't it? Drew Barrymore as well. It's a really good film. It's a really good film. For the first time director, I think it was as well. Richard Stanley? Um, yeah, someone like that. But uh, we covered it for an Easter special many, many, many years ago. But uh, great movie, good time travel, um, and probably the first thing Jake Gyllenhaal did, I should imagine, if not one of the first things. Yeah, <clears> I know. I expected to do stuff where he's like a, a wee nipper. But, um, yeah, that no, was a really good movie. We were watching that game. It was really good. Um, must say, everybody, um, we, we are going to be starting next, uh, starting this fund, crowdfunder for our next short film in about a week's time, I think. Well, it's when we've got like 50 followers to the page. Uh, we're, we're halfway there already, which is quite good. Um, and it's a crowdfunder, Dan. Um, you know this anyway, because you're involved. For a uh, Star Wars horror fan film, dun, 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 dun. it's just like just like let's just have some fun in the woods and film some stormtroopers in the foggy woods being hunted. It's like that, that's just yeah, yeah. Can we reveal the title? Yeah, you can go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's called Star Wars. Uh, what is it called? Century Moon. Sanctuary. I was going to say Century Moon. Sanctuary, Sanctuary Moon. Moon. Yeah. Um, yes, once we hit 50 followers, then the Kickstarter will open, yeah. and there'll, uh, so, be, there'll so, be different you, tiers. So you can um, uh, look for it now, if you like, on Kickstarter. If you look for it, type in Star Wars Century Moon, you'll probably find it. And you can do a little follow, and that'd be really cool if you did that. Um, and yeah, call and share it, please. If you want to see that film, to uh, give us a couple of bucks. But don't worry, if you can't do it, it's just, you know, if you can. And it's all just obviously going towards it, because we're not making any money off it, because fucking Disney's property, and hopefully they won't shut us down. Oh, dear. Shouldn't do. I think they're all behind fans doing stuff like this. It's good for them as well, so... You never know, George, George Mute Lucas might turn up in the George forest. George Lucas? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, yeah, George. Yeah, you never know. He might be hiding out in the woods. George Lucas or Mark Hamill. Yeah. Maybe Warwick Davis. You never know. Um, anyway, so we're going to be doing that soon, so do look out for that, and uh, we're going to give you some updates while we do the podcast. Not to date the podcast, but uh, we'll date the podcast. If you go on the the, the podcast on Haunted Hill um, Facebook page as well, we've recently shared the link on there as well. Yeah. Um, we've also shared a shared casting call, and we'll share any, any, any photos or any updates that we can without spoiling it because obviously we don't ever really want to give anything away about these these shorts that we make um but yeah we we're excited and we're excited to get you guys hyped up for it um, certainly uh, very exciting when it's done uh, ultimately patrons uh who uh um or the fund crowd funders for the film they will get a copy of the um film itself and um, then it's going on YouTube anyway. It's not doing like a festival run because sometimes we do short films and it's like, but once it's done, you're still not going to see it. And then when it comes out, it's almost like, oh, yeah, that film we made, yeah, you can see it now. Then nobody really watches it. This, though, we can actually do like a YouTube premiere. We we'll, like do a countdown like a week before, whatever, and go like, you know, build up to it and stuff. Um, and there'll be loads of, hopefully, loads of Star Wars fans that watch it and like it. I hope they like it because it's just a horror movie we want to make. Gonna be good. Just it's like, be very, very just very like good. fun to do with your friends, but like fucking hell, we could probably make something pretty decent here. So we're all going out on it. We're working super fucking hard. Like three D printed, John three D printed a fucking full on rifle, <laughs> which yeah. is like this big. Uh, uh, and I was like, what the shit? So like, and it's like, yeah, we've got that. It's like, fuck. And we've got all the blasters. We've got two stormtrooper, proper legit stormtrooper outfits. One's from the maker from Shepton's Film Studios. It's like legit shit. Um, yeah, so... And uh, I saw that you were getting stoned the other night. I mean, you were making a rock the other night. Making my rock. My rock's amazing. Uh, might even do a little video of how to make rocks, because I did just like that fucking... That, that rocks, basically. Gav's rocks tutorial. Gav's rock rocks. Good stuff. Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> uh, um, do follow that if you can, please, guys. Um, if you want to see a Star Wars horror movie, you know. Who basically. doesn't? Yeah, absolutely. And if you can't... Chip in, you know, that's fine, absolutely cool. 
if you could share it, someone else that you share it to might be out chipping. So yeah, you know. every little helps. Yeah. One other thing uh, I wanted to mention while I was um, off sick, my father-in-law recommended a book to me. Um, which he's, he was listening to an Audible. Uh, and he said, oh, Dan, I think you'll like this. And it's called Hollywood, the Oral History. Um, and it's not Harvey Weinstein. It's not that kind of oral history, no. It's uh, yeah. It was 28 hours long, but I, I listened to it at 1.5 speed because that's about as fast as I read anyway. Um, and it was so good. And it's by some Sam Wasson and Janine Bassinger. And basically, it's... 28 hours if you want to listen to it or you can buy a book version of it of famous people directors producers actors um, makeup artists musicians whoever it is and it starts off at the very beginning during the silent movies when they've just come in and it's snippets yeah and it's snippets all the way through so it starts in like 1910 20 all the way through till about 2010 did it discuss very quickly sorry did it discuss um was there anybody that discussed the fact that when it went to talkies some of the people who were the faces uh ended up having shit voices and couldn't get any work yeah it did and it also discussed that they didn't think Which talkies would ever work they thought in the part of movie history they said none of this, this is not going to work people are going to go back to silent films at some point because yeah. this won't work at all and also when they switched to talkies they realized they had to change and, and invent all new ca- cameras and lights because everything they were using was so loud um they had oh, to like shit, change everything yeah. so new cameras were being invented just Dolly because tracks, of that. stuff like that yeah, yeah all that kind of stuff yeah. um Really good, really interesting, all the way through, right up until, you know, they're interviewing Brad Pitt, George Clooney, right up till now, even um, uh, Neil, what's his name, Neil uh, Jordan, is it, from uh, the UK, who did Dog Soldiers, Uh, you know, people like that are getting a a little mention and stuff, it's just really fascinating stuff, funny little anecdotes, and it's all snippets of just conversation and interviews all the way through, but done in a really great way. And what's it called again? For the it's called Hollywood, the Oral History. Really good stuff. And if you can't be bothered to read it, um, my father-in-law sent me the link because he's allowed to send off like very certain links if he's a member of whatever. Oh, so I, I got sent it. To, yeah, it's really good. I'll see if I can send it over to you. Um, it you is can. really, 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 really good. Uh, and it just kept me riveted all the way through because I loved hearing it as you move through. It even gets into like the 70s when the Exorcist and Spielberg comes in and you hear about him like trying to make this shark movie and, you know, and then it gets up through to a 3D and then George Lucas comes in and Star Wars and that changed so much. And it's just a very fascinating uh, journey through the last hundred years of cinema. Really good stuff. Audible also has a really good Universal one, which is free, actually. Universal podcast series going through the history of uh, Universal uh, Monsters and sort of the story of that, basically. And the ah. Universal Studios. And it's really fascinating. And it's, um, the dude who does the voice, he does a few of them, but he's got, he's got a really good voice. It's like a really good voice. My favourite anecdote from the one I've just listened to before I shut up about it was Spielberg was talking about... Um, he got to meet Bernard Herrmann mm-hmm. and he got introduced to him and he described him as this big fat guy smoking a cigar. He had ash all over his stomach because <laughs> he was just sweet. And he said, um, oh, um, Bernard Herrmann, it's so lovely to meet you. I really, really love you. And he said, oh, yeah, if you love me so much, why the fuck do you keep using Johnny Williams in all your films? Kind of true. <laughs> and then that was the last, that was, that was the night he died, Bernard Herrmann. So, Spielberg said I met him, and then found out the next day he died in his sleep that night. That has just then uh, just started <laughs> composed uh, Taxi Driver. How uh, funny is Because he died before he saw the making of that, uh, the actual film. Why the fuck do you keep using Johnny Williams in all your films? It's fucking true, though. Dude is fucking <laughs> Hitchcock composer. Come on. Why the fuck not? Yeah, it's a bit weird, really, yeah. <laughs> But there we go. What about you? Is there anything that you've watched or anything before we um, get into Don's email? Uh, just finished watching the last recent season of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm on a totally ah. different uh, note to horror. Um, and I was loving it. I, I love Larry David. I can see myself as Larry David. <laughs> Curb Your Enthusiasm. I haven't seen the newest season. Um, it is right. But uh, I 
there isn't really a bad episode in that show. It's up there with It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I do really like it. I've only sort of... With Sunny in Philadelphia, you can sort of uh, do it over and over, which I have done. Curb, I haven't so much. So I, I've got them all. I like, I've slowly been collecting the DVDs, even though I don't even watch them that frequently. But I might go through them again. Um, it's... I do like the predicaments he gets in, and uh, I've got into a couple of them before, actually. Yeah, I, ended, I, I ended up moving I, someone's house with stuff once, and I got to the point where I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> what? And I just put something down and walked off. I couldn't believe it. I was like, no. <laughs> so there's many great episodes in that. But in my life, whenever something strange or unusual happens, in my head, I just hear, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I think one of my favourite episodes is where he meets Michael J. Fox yeah. and Michael J. Fox really plays up his Parkinson's disease when he's to in get like pretty hotel shit. above him in a yeah. room and he has a go at him and says, You're making so much noise last night and he says, It's because I've got Parkinson's, I'm walking around, I can't help it and so he's trying to make him feel bad and then he's looking at him going, oh, You're making that up. It's so good, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. He's very good at getting actors in to play weird versions of themselves. Yeah. Um, Christian Slater yeah, was another Woody good Harrison's one. In one recently. Yeah, yeah, very, very good stuff. But apart nice from one. That, um, I have watched some horror stuff here and there with little bits and bobs, but I don't know. I, I, don't, I never remember what I watched. Anyway, let's get out of here, man. Let's get on to. Well, let, our let's first start with film. let's start with Don's email first of all, or the intro of his email. Well, do you, let's have a break. And then okay, we'll let's have a break. That, yeah, and that gets into the whole film thing. I've just broke my leg. This will keep it quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me Cutting a New Show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing... All the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars... You can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. We appreciate it and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. And we are back. So uh, we'll start off with Don's email. So thanks again, Don, our patron, patron of the episode, your patron pick. Yeah, Don, thank your, you your... very much for sending this to us. Um, and like I said before, if you're a patron, you get the chance to do this and have this. So, um, Dan? So, Don, you're wearing an imaginary crown for this episode. You're the king of this episode. King uh, Don, so, King Don. King Don. <laughs> um, there we go. So... <laughs> I said King Don. <laughs> NG. Oh, anyway, yes. Carry on. Uh, so, his email begins, Hi, Dan and Gav. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on both of these movies. I consider them both to be classics, and both are very nostalgic to me for different reasons. I'm especially excited to hear you guys do your usual deep dive on both of these films. That's the first thing that drew me to your podcast, the length of your conversations, and the deep breakdowns. I've had quite a few. I've heard quite a few pod, uh, horror podcasts uh, over the years, but only a couple that don't wear out their welcome. You guys are both consistently endearing and genuine, and that really allows listeners like myself to feel like I know you and I'm part of the conversation. Oh, thank you very much. That's nice to know. You never talk down to us, as many horror podcasts tend to do. So I'm a huge fan of the other segments, such as hanging out in that sketchy time machine, <laughs> oh, um, and spending time with our good friend Bill, hearing about all strange occurrences in the world. I also appreciate the insight into your personal lives, as we all go through our own ups and downs with family, relationships, health, and everything else that life throws at us. So thank you. I'll start by saying that picking films was very hard. I'm a huge fan of found footage, and I loved your found footage-themed episodes. I even have my own very small found footage-themed podcast, so I wanted to give at least one found uh, footage movie in my selection, but I kept coming back to a few movies that I think about all the time, and after narrowing my list down and excluding the movies that you've already covered, I decided on these two films. 
So that's the start of his email. Thank you so much, Don. <laughs> Thanks for your kind words. Really yeah, appreciate no, really, really support. appreciate that. It's really nice. And it's, um, it's re- I think um, Dan and I have uh, been friends before we start the podcast. Yeah, I suppose you generally start a podcast with your friends anyway. Um, it's very easy for me and him to discuss live stuff, isn't it, Dan? Because it's just like we're just chatting to each other, really. You know? um, it's it nice is. to have all of you as a uh, little family members anyway. And I find it so bizarre that a podcast would talk down to their to their listeners. Seems <laughs> seems, seems as counterintuitive, surely. surely. <laughs> I know. I think the best podcasts are ones, and we've had this. It's probably the most consistent compliment we get is it's like listening to a couple of friends, mm. uh, which we are. So yeah, you yeah, know, absolutely. that's kind of a reason for oh, it. Really. We, don't hold, we don't keep things back. You know, if you've got polls, you would tell me this. Yeah, I, I don't anymore. <laughs> but thank you, um, Don. Full disclosure. I hope you don't mind. We've actually flipped your order. You put. Poltergeist first, then Hereditary. We are going to cover Hereditary first, and then Poltergeist. That's, that's kind of my little preference. Yeah, there. but well, it's still our show at the end of the day. But Don has picked these episodes, so we're going to go to a trader now for Hereditary, and then when we come back, we will do the synopsis and Don's take on the movie, and then we'll get into some Hereditary beheading. I know, I can't wait for this. But right now, here is a trader for Hereditary. Come on, Peter. Let's just sue it. It's heartening to see so many strange new faces here today. I know my mom would be very touched and probably a little suspicious. My mother was a very secretive and private woman. It's Grandma. You know you were her favorite, right? Even when you were a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. She was a very difficult woman, which maybe explains me. I recognize you from your mother. What? Sometimes I swear I can feel them in the room. Oh my God! What's that? What kind of she isn't gone. She had private rituals, private friends. Who's going to take care of me? You don't think I'm going to take care of you? But when you die. And she wasn't altogether there. <laughs> At the end. any more stress on my family. A grieving family is haunted by tragic and disturbing occurrences. Uh, Before we get into um, the cast and then into our deep dive, as Don says, just read out Don's take on this. Now, full disclosure, guys, listening, if you've not seen Hereditary, there's going to be some uh, spoilers and I think even in Don's email, there's some spoilers as well. Um, but it says at the beginning of the show, if you haven't seen Hereditary, stop now, go watch it. Unless you don't want to watch it and just want to hear us talk about it, whatever. Just letting you know, we're going to get into some big old spoilers. So Don says, I wanted to bring up a modern classic to be discussed. And when I think modern classics, I think The Witch, which you've already covered wonderfully, and Hereditary. This film is incredible and continues to add nuance every time I watch it. I also had a memorable first watch, which adds to the experience. I always enjoy listening to Gav talking about sharing horror movies with his kids. And soon we will get to hear your experiences with this too, Dan, um, as I made a horror fan of my daughter from a young age. I was a single dad and was raising a kid on my own with limited income, and it made movies an integral activity that we could share without spending a fortune. My daughter was always mature for her age and loved horror. I wouldn't expose her to gore and sex and language before it was appropriate, but as with my own experience, 
experience with movies like Poltergeist. You're always the right age for a good scare in my family. Uh, this is not the case with all kids, but if they enjoy it and then they understand it, and, it's, and they understand that it's not real, then it's all good. So that being said, my daughter was a teenager when this movie came out, and we couldn't wait to get to the theatre during its opening week. We both were a bit confused by the family with small children sitting behind us. Oh, God. <laughs> And the elderly couple to our right when we took our seats. There's this always an elderly couple. No, every time you go to a horror movie, there's always just one elderly couple. And you're like, I know that's going to be me and Sarah, but there's always just one elderly couple. And especially if it's a fucked up film or something, it's always like, why are they here? And sometimes they walk out halfway through. Well, he says, but it, this wasn't a problem as they weren't in the theatre for long. <laughs> there you go. I still don't know if the clicking sound was coming from the soundtrack of the film or from other movie uh, fellow moviegoers, and sometimes from myself, but the family with the young kids left screaming at some point less than halfway through. The elderly couple the left head, shaking... The, the child's head <laughs> cock being lopped off by the telegraph pole probably did it. <laughs> the elderly couple left shaking their heads when one of the big scares... Uh, when one of the big scenes comes on after the brother and the sister leave the party, so that would have been that scene. Um... All, the, all of this added to our own sense of fear and dread that this movie hits, with, hits you with. From the opening funeral scenes with the odd smiling funeral goers to the awkward dinner scenes, this movie loves to make you feel uncomfortable. The cast is amazing and the film looks incredible. I've already mentioned the sound and how perfect it was in the theatre, but the look of this movie is iconic. From the beautiful woods surrounding the house to the flawless editing from miniature art to actual rooms and, the pe and then real people, I'm still blown away. Every actor in this movie kills it gabriel burns looks uh, so exhausted and worn out like any dad would going through all of this yeah. um tony coletti looks so sad and fragile in some scenes uh and utterly horrific in other scenes i lost my shit when i heard the rhythmic banging on the attic door and when that turned in and um, then what that turned into slow sawing around you uh a slow sawing sound that gradually sped up and then the image that accompanied it. This is another movie that I can go on and on about, but I've said enough. The people are here to listen to you guys talk about these movies, not me. Don, those are amazing words. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you, Don. Very well written, great stuff, and that's a fucking hilarious uh, story about watching that in the cinema. And uh, to another point, totally agree with the uh, um, uh, the aspect of using uh, films for um, uh, entertainment purposes when you haven't got the bucks to go out and do stuff when you've got children. And I have been someone that's done that many times. I'm sure many other people who've got children have done it as well. Like, And it's so nice. Uh, um, and it's the power of uh, films. So nice to have movies which can take you away to another place. And that's why we love them. And that's why you're here to listen to me and Daniel talk about them. But yes, films are incredible. So I completely agree with you on that whole thing of parenting. And Dan, you will be doing this soon with your kid. Well, not soon, a few years. And uh, let them see all these cool movies and things, you know. I except, sat there and watched, they're sitting um... there chatting to their mates on their phones. And then they just go, I am watching it. And then at the end, they're just like, yeah, I'll, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I sat I'll... down and watched Cars with them the other day, the oh, Disney nice. movie. Great. I used to love watching Jack. Cars. Well, yeah, so do I. But um, my son says, car, whenever a car comes on screen. So within about 10 minutes of that film, he'd said, car, about 100 times. <laughs> and I... <laughs> Oh, Thankfully, man. he got bored of it after about 15 I was minutes. Say, he cause... must have got bored. His throat must have been like, oh, God. Car. <laughs> car. 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 Uh, Hereditary is directed by uh, Ari Aston. Now, this was his first feature. He has directed some shorts, but this is his first feature film. And then went on to direct Midsummer, which people also consider to be a modern classic. So, only two features under his belt so far, but he's definitely. This is pretty much out of the gates, pretty strong, strong uh, opener, isn't it? Yeah. Um, also, um, talking about the cast, Tony Galetti, she doesn't like doing horror unless it's something that particularly grabs her and obviously this script grabbed her she it's was obviously it's amazing though like straight out of the, you know i i'm sure i'm saying straight out i'm sure the guy's probably been working his ass off for years doing, doing different stuff but like to have that cast the cast that he has and with gabriel burn as well gabriel burn is incredible in it um 
Uh, and I was going to say Tony Coletti, obviously, was quite memorable in Sixth Sense as well. Uh, but she's a fantastic actress in her own right. And then I think Millie Shapiro as Charlie, she's wonderful in it. Uh, but I do think one of the most incredible performances in this is uh, Peter, played by Alex Wolf, uh, their son. Um, I think it's just absolutely heartbreaking, his performance. Just great stuff. Um, yes, and you're right, Don, the sets are amazing. What a wonderful way to you know to to do this using miniatures you know with the mum being a a model maker the way we zoom in it could appear very cheesy we've seen it done before quite cheesily in other movies but it works very very well in this yeah the sound is fantastic and some of the choices in sort of the way we we just cut cold cut to less for example that severed head Oof, things like that very very good well directed fantastic film mm. um my story with it very briefly is as gav mentioned earlier we watched it together i didn't like it i don't know why i didn't mind it but you really didn't like it and then really you just didn't. went on one i was like okay <laughs> let you go but, over it <laughs> then i watched it a second time and realized and it, the second time i watched it was was just after i'd lost my mum so i was dealing with my own loss and grief and it reached out and grabbed me by the heart wow. and mm. this third time around still got those feelings i still cried on two or three scenes but also now i saw so much more that's opened the film up to another level to me so i've seen this film three times now I give it a strong eight, 8 out of 10 IMDb. So out the gate, guys, I'm like, my card's on the table. I'm going to be really gushing over this movie. I think it's fantastic. So really glad we got the chance to talk about it. Gav, have you you've seen it, what, two, three times perhaps as well now? Yeah. Um, so I watched it with Sarah because she's, she's, she'd only seen it recently again. Um, but I like to watch with her because uh, it's good to for her and I sometimes to have like a conversation, a little points in the movie, just like... So what's what that? And she helps me out a little bit from confused, but also um, to to have like the conversations that we have, and films like this, like The Witch, like uh, I imagine not really Poltergeist so much, but um, some films we we can really have deep conversation. Things like Critters too, you can't, and that's probably why I, I sort of dissed at that time when we started pl- really going into that. Do you know what I mean? But a uh, film like this, it's like. If, you know, this has been getting some deepness going on here. This is like, yeah, there's going to be loads of layers and stuff here. I, I, I'm not going to, from my onset of watching this, I just like took my notes as I normally would. But like, there's the best thing about having this conversation. Obviously, with my reviewer eye, I could, I was looking at different things. But the best thing about having this conversation with you, sometimes we open up stuff which is not in my notes, but between us, our notes combined <laughs> break, break the big note wall. <laughs> And well, a like new thing Voltron combined, and we and we discover stuff. Um, so I feel like that is going to be what's going on in this conversation. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll I, try like, my best. I liked it, and I enjoyed watching it again. It's a bit to answer your question. I'll try my best to cover everything, but it's so such a layered, deep film. Yeah, we're we're going to miss stuff. You can listen to another podcast, and they talk about, it and they might pick up on totally different stuff that we to pick up on. Cool. Yeah. So we start off with a funeral, which is kind of the theme of this film really death and well, loss it's a picture a... of death at the beginning don't we Same yeah hmm. um yeah it's a yeah and an invitation to the funeral essentially and then we get to see but we had that just before that we had that massive opening shot the first opening the first shot of the film or the film and it's basically going into the miniature house that's right and that's just like just that one shot and the choice of having that as a shot for your opening shot going into this miniature it's going into this look straight away it could be like it's going into this she's made all this miniature house hasn't she she's made this little world yep also she's made the family she has and, and, um, and do you know what I mean it could be going and we're going into that right now this is why the camera's doing that you could even look at it like that or it's just like a nice cinematic choice where it looks nice but whatever the first opening shot of that is just like that's that's there for a reason well I think the reason is that they do not have a choice in anything that happens they are playthings they're toys in themselves uh, I think that's the reason for that in my opinion sure. um, the whole thing is is predetermined that you know as we, as we will find out everything is geared towards something happening um, for a reason for a cult and yeah it feels like 
that was part of the choice really maybe it wasn't but that maybe well maybe that's one of the many layers but that's the beauty of this really uh, I, I should have really, mentioned it's just really good though because just very quickly give when we first talk about this goes with pushes all the way into this room and then it sits there for a moment and you can see it, you, know, you know it's a miniature because your mind's just been told it's a miniature so you're and watching then Gabriel, it Gabriel Byrne walks into the room he walks into shot ah brain quickly change <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, quickly, should mention that Ariasta also wrote this as well. So, very it's talented man. A, it's a very lovely transition, by the way. Um, I think it's a really lovely open shot. It really just pulls you into the film. Yeah. So, it's the day of the funeral, um, and we find out that it's Tony Collette's mother um, who has passed away. Open she, casket. Have you ever yeah. been to an open casket funeral? Oh, I wouldn't like it. I don't know. Like I'd be like, oh, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Thankfully, I have not, no. Um, I, don't, I think I've only ever seen one dead body, and that, that's kind of enough for me, really. Um, although I'm sure there'll be more to come in my life, as, as we all will probably see one or two dead bodies as we all get old and die. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So, dead Kick funeral. Bum. Gabriel Byrne um, goes in and starts waking up the family. Uh, I think Peter's still in bed, Uh Everyone's getting their suits on. Charlie, the daughter, slept in the treehouse. That treehouse dra- just draws her, just draws her in. We've got another tree in the next movie too, haven't we? Oh, that fucking tree. Uh, yeah. um, at the funeral, Annie reads the eulogy of her mother. She reads, my mother was a difficult woman, which basically says she was very hard to love and very hard to like, but she was my mum and... You know, we are sad that she's dead, but we didn't have a fantastic relationship. But um, she had dementia towards the end and was very difficult and quite aggressive. And but just was never a very good mother in her eyes all the way through. And obviously, she's a mum now. She's got a boy and a girl, and she's trying her best to be a good mum. Very. Uh, we see uh, some bit basic foreshadowing here where Charlie's been uh, uh, having discussion about the chocolate bar that Charlie's eating. Has he got nuts in it? No, he hasn't got nuts in it. Are you sure? Have we got the allergy thing? Later on, though, <clears throat> it does piss me off. It's like, if she has such a fucking nut problem, why have you guys not have the, alle- the, the fucking pen, you know, the EpiPen or whatever, everywhere? Everywhere you go, everywhere she goes, she has the EpiPen or, or jump in. Everywhere you are, whoever yeah. supervises. And that's why later on, when he when she goes to that party, it's just like, why is not got the EpiPen? Like, I find, I don't know, it frustrated me as a parent. So we should mention the daughter, Charlie. She, I would say, she is autistic in some way. Um, it's, it, that's how it feels. It's being portrayed. There's definitely something yeah. on the spectrum with her. Yeah, she, like autism. She makes uh, that clicking sound, which is in all the trailers. Um, and I think this movie really um, tricked its audience. And again, here's a massive spoiler. But because the, the, the trailers all made out that this this noise and this girl were going to be in the main feature of the film, the killing her off in the first sort of 25 minutes of the film was just psycho levels of, as in, you know... Uh, Strange choice, though, but you are correct. I remember thinking that as well. And a strange choice, though, because it's a really good film in itself anyway, so you don't need to hide that or try and advertise that because that's not really the movie I would want to see. I like the movie that I do see. I think, though, that's what was so shocking about it is when that that, that scene does happen, you're like, whoa, okay. Yeah. This, is, this is like the shower scene in Psycho. I thought that we were following our lead here. What's going on? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, Annie's not really very sad about it. Uh, about her mum dying and she they'll get back to the house she's working on a little hospital scene so it's like her therapy is she makes a model of something that's just happened so in this occasion it's her mum in the hospital bed and her stood next to her and things like that dad gabriel Byrne checks in with the eldest son pete there's a bit of a nice moment where he sort of says are you all right and he's like yeah as in like they're not glad she's dead but it's not like she's going to be missed is what you get and they don't even say that but you can feel that that's kind of what they're I don't imagine they probably saw her that much yeah um mum Annie starts looking through Charlie's sketchbook and uh she sees very sort of disturbing images that she's drawing and she realised Charlie uh, Charlie catches mum doing this and she says 
Grandma wanted me to be a boy. And it's just just leaves it there. And all these little bits, the first time or the second time you watch it, you're like... Well, it's also also about a family, like, the disruptive, disruptiveness of what happens and goes on with this family and just the way it just unfolds and just goes into... You know, just dropping that as like a little taster. You know, making a making a uh, making a recipe day, and we're going to make a cake today. It's going to be a, a cake of family destruction, and uh, just a, we're going to put a little bit of a, a little bit of flavouring in that to get it going. It's going to be a oh, <clears throat> one of the other members wanted me to be a different sex. Great, thanks. Just a, just a little bit to get make us all happy. Let's throw that in there to start us up with. Later on, as your head's coming off anyway, and we're going to throw that in the cake. But you know. Annie in the night wakes up and thinks she sees a shadow in the corner. Um, there's lots of moments where you think you might see something in a corner. And... Well, well, when her mum's looking at uh, the, her mum's stuff uh, and she sees her mum in the corner. It's just, and you've got to really look it's not there. initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. And this will happen a lot. And again, once you understand the ending... You can go back to the beginning, and a lot, even some of the people at the funeral who are smiling, they will come back at the, in the treehouse scene at the very end as well. Um, so look out for those guys. There's a few of them you'll, you'll notice. I think the bold guy is the one that stands out the most. So next day, school day, and Charlie's in class, and uh, she sort of sat there doing her <coughs> noise that she likes to make, and suddenly a bird hits the window and scares all the kids in the class. Apart from her. Uh, well, she doesn't care. She doesn't fucking care. hates birds. I was watching the other day this... this <laughs> kind of makes me think of this... Uh, no reaction at all makes me think of this dude the other day. There's a f- footage of this bar and these people in this bar. The camera's pointed down towards it. A couple of people drinking and that. A guy sort of smoking cigarettes and he's eating some food at the bar. And this guy comes in behind him with a gun. Tempted the wallets, get down, get down, they all get down. So it's one guy's like, eh. <laughs> just stay sitting there eating his, eating his food. Smokes a cigarette, drinks a beer, just puts his wallet out like that, whatever. Where he's just, no, or, or he doesn't let him have the wallet. One of the two, or I saw another one, and then just puts the wallet out like that, just lets him take it, and he smokes it, and just gives it back to him, yeah, great, and just carries on. He doesn't get down at all, then the guy just leaves, and he just doesn't even look at him or anything. No, not seen, phased, not phased. I've seen phone, someone filmed it on their phone of a, um, in a McDonald's in London. Yeah. A massive fight between, like, five guys all punching each other and throwing chairs around. And there's one guy just sat at a table eating a Big Mac. And he, <laughs> yeah, done, yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't even move. He's just sort of watching and, like, think, it's not even happening. I think we can call this type of person, and I think <laughs> this is what she is in this, old Charlie. We, we can call them the Mac Mac, the Big Mac. Big Mac, Return of the Mac. So Charlie right there is being a Big Mac, ignoring that bird hitting the window. <laughs> um, so the bird hits the window. Uh, we do cut to Pete in his class, and he is really getting behind. Uh, I think Pete has discovered weed. Um, this is this is the issue. He's we, falling. We all bit. discover weed in in uh, education. Um, he, so he's slipping behind in his classes a little bit. Going back to Charlie, though, she's outside, and she goes outside to retrieve that dead bird. <laughs> she doesn't retrieve all of it, though. God, come on, it'd be too much to carry. She grabs a little pair of scissors, doesn't she, and she does a cobra pizza move. <laughs> yeah, she does the cobra pizza move. A pair of scissors. I always she's... did it like that, actually, um, my pizza the other day. She snips off the pigeon's head and just pops the head in her pocket. Lovely. And uh, she looks over and she sees a lady at the gates waving at her and she thinks, it's a bit weird. A bit weird, but I'm a bit weird. I've just, I've got a bird's head in my uh, pocket. Uh, imagine doing the, like, laundry, like, because I always have to check my kids' pockets sure for, like, tissues. slugs and raisins. <laughs> but if I find, if I find a pigeon's head, I'll be like, Edith! What are you Come doing? <laughs> What's the worst thing your mum's ever found in your pocket? <clears throat> don't know, can't remember. I'm sh- I'm sure there's stuff. Oh. What, <laughs> what about you? Um, it's really embarrassing, but um, when I was at school... I knew, you, see, when you go and pose that, pose that question to me, I knew you had a little fucking story about yourself. Go on then. When, when I was at school, um, someone found a porno mag in the woods, as you always did. Did you see that in your pocket? 
Oh, you I had a folded up bit of paper, didn't you? Somebody cut out a phone number that said, uh, call this number and I'll talk dirty to you until you're completely satisfied. Words to that effect. And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I just took it off that person and put it in my top pocket of my shirt. Didn't think anything of it. And then weeks later, my mum was telling me off for something. She went, and that's another thing I want to talk to you about. And she pulled this little bit of paper out of a drawer and she'd saved it up for uh, an argument as ammo. And she said, if I ever find this number on our phone bill, you'll be in deep trouble. I haven't told your father about it yet, but I will, believe me. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ. I haven't even rung it. I haven't had a chance to ring it. You've taken it off me. <laughs> but yeah, so there we go. But it wasn't a pigeon head. No. Okay. There we go. So what's next? Annie uh, sees a triangle on the floor of her mother's bedroom, which she's never noticed before. Now, I must say, going back to the, when they first get home from the mum's funeral, if you listen very carefully, as just before they open the front door and come in the house, you can hear footsteps of people upstairs in their house. Okay. This will this will be the members of the cult putting the triangle on the floor and putting a little gift in the attic for them, which she will find later. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's not a fine thing to find in the loft, isn't it? If you listen carefully, you will hear people in the house when they're not in the house or just before they're getting in the house, which is very interesting. So, yeah, she finds this triangle on the floor. This is not very boozy in the loft. Well, what would be worse, Gary Boosie or Nick Nolte? I don't know. Both. Together, naked, touching each other. I wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to understand what either of them is saying, though. Be like two melted candles. Because Nick Nolte's like, and then Gary Boos is like, you know. Anyway, uh, she's freaked out by the triangle on the floor and she gets, she locks the door and says to her husband, sorry, I just, you know, I want to keep mum's bedroom door locked for now. Goes to a support group, doesn't she? She does. Well, before that, there's a call from the cemetery um, to Gabriel mm. Byrne. Mm. And he doesn't tell Annie about this, but her mum's grave has been desecrated. Um, and he's like, what would you mean desecrated? And they sort of say, you don't really hear what they say, but we later find out that the grave's been completely dug up. So he doesn't tell Annie about this. She's got enough going on at the moment. But, um, yeah, so you're right. Annie attends a grief counselling group, doesn't she? Is that not, though, what they find in the loft? Yes. That's what I'm saying. So the cult... But... Oh, right. Is your timeline right, then? Yeah. So they come back from the funeral... And there's already people in their house but, putting that but, triangle down on the floor. But they haven't put the body in yet because it's too quick. That has to be later. That probably... Probably... But they could still have done it if they were acting fast enough. They'd still be at the funeral. They'd only put the body in the bloody ground. But even so, there's people in their house. Yes, I agree with you with the, the triangle, the symbolism thing. Um, but I don't think the body, I think they must have sneaked, snuck that in later. Later on when she's at the cinema or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Annie goes to a grief counselling group. Um, and she's not really into it but she's no, a... she, no she's just kind of like you know she she's 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 clutching at straws a, a, a little bit really isn't she she's like really wants the support and wants some something probably outside the family from her well, uh, why why can't she go to her husband what's what's the score of that then well he's not a psychiatrist is he and she's got a lot i mean she reveals at this support group that her mum had dementia that her brother hung himself because he heard yeah, there's voices. A few, there's a few things, isn't there? Um, that her her dad killed himself as well. Um, so she's had her dad and her brother kill themselves. Her her um, brother was called Charles, so she named Charlie after her brother. And um, both her parents ended up either one. Of, well, her dad killed himself and her mum died of dementia. So she's not. And she's not got a great little bit of news coming up in a moment as well. It's not. It's just not the way she says it. It's just sort of thing. The fact that um, her brother's suicide was blaming he, uh, her brother blamed their mum for uh, trying to put people in him. Obviously, like you know, demons or whatever the fuck. Yeah. And committed suicide. With that then the dad fucking starved himself to death. 
she says. It's like, what, from depression? What the shit? Fucking hell, that's not like just your average, like, oh, there's, there's an accident and a car accident, they both passed. It's like, fucking hell, not normal. What's very clever about this scene is this is your exposition dump. This is your background on Annie and her fucked up family and why that when Charlie dies in a few scenes time, why all of this will send her over the edge. What do you think Ari Aster wrote this film? Like, it is, it is just full on, like, it's like family I should no imagine. More. Do you know what I mean? There's some real shit going on there. Not the same, with, not the same with him and his well, family. I was going to say, I should I imagine. Gonna, you do, you are supposed to write what you know because it's going to say, I, I, I should imagine this is some form of therapy and he may well have gone through a loss of at least some member of his family hmm. um, to come up with this kind of thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, she blames herself ultimately, and she cries at this support group. So actually, she got something out of that, which is good. Um, we get we get to see Pete getting high, looking at Facebook. Pete's on the bone. He's checking out um, uh, Facebook, stalking a girl in class that he quite likes. So, you know, there we go. And doing he gets every, invited. Doing everything a teenage boy does, I suppose, really. And he gets invited to a party tomorrow. Do you want to come to a party? And he's like, yeah, boy. So that's good. As long as they're playing Vanilla Ice soundtrack. Or even if Kid and Play turn up. <clears throat> I remember going to a party <clears throat> from school. Excuse my throat. Um, turned up. And uh, the hottest track at the time right then was Ice Ice Baby. Oh, yeah. And I remember, I remember even standing on a, f a bit of the fireplace bit and jumping off and swinging my hand and doing that. In the air and landed. When Ice Ice Baby came out, um, Nobody knew what that was. Who's listening? Only Dan knows. Right? That was you swinging your swinging fist in a circular fist movement. In jump. Yeah, boy! When Ice Ice Baby came out um, in the very early 90s, was school disco time for me. I went to the school disco and demanded that my mum let me wear... She bought me and let me wear a pair of dungarees uh, with, with, with one strap undone. <clears throat> Absolutely. Just like Will Smith in The Fresh Prince. Did you have bottle taps on your boots? I did not, no. I um, I had some really whack trainers that I was wearing. But, um, but I remember thinking I looked so fly. And my auntie was a hairdresser. And I said to her, look, can you do me Vanilla Ice's hair? And Is she tried. Lines? No, no, just she put some like hair mousse in it and got the front bit up as best she could. But I just looked terrible. And by the time I'd got to the disco in my dad's car... Is there photo evidence that the world needs no, to see right now? I don't think there is. But by the time I got to the disco, my hair had wilted anyway. <laughs> but I didn't care. So I got there and I did the running man and Floppy all the moves. I basically waited all night for Ice Ice Baby and You Can't Touch This to come on so that I could bust out all my moves on the floor and impress literally no girls at all. But in your mind... You were fucking um, kicking ass. In my mind, I was the Fresh Prince, do you know what I mean? But in real life, I was more like Screech from Saved by the Bell. <laughs> yeah. It's like that Sunny in Philadelphia when they think they're doing really well at their school reunion dance. Oh, God. And it cuts and it's just uh, uh, Mac at the front going, <laughs> That's literally what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, we catch up with Charlie... And she's doing some weird craft, cutting things out and making shapes. <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to check out her little craft box. No. It's going to be in here. It's going to be loads of heads, a cat's oh, leg God. and yeah. fuck knows what. Um, and a weird light sort of passes through the room. And yeah, we see this yeah. light quite a lot. And it's... Is it, like a, is it like a spirit? Yeah, I think it is. It's the spirit of the demon that, that is present throughout this. It's a nice looking demon light, isn't it? Yeah, it's lovely. Could have been like really like red and uh, somehow, I don't know how it uh, transpires into a light form, but you know. Well, it kind of tricks me anyway, because it, because it does look like a nice light as it floats past people. It almost feels like a good presence, like a good spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's grandma checking up on Charlie, which it probably is. Um, uh, uh, Annie is uh, getting a phone call from the uh, museum. She is basically a bit late on uh, uh, making uh, houses for the, uh, the exhibit she is doing. Um, so that's something for us to all to know, that, she, that her <laughs> her mind's presence is, has been taken over of the actual d d the on, the, on the job, so to speak. She's just missing out on work because she's starting to crack a little bit. 
Yeah, she's grieving. She's yeah, falling she's apart, and not doing it too good, she's got she? she's got this exhibition that she's just not going to get there on time now. For so Pete says, "Hey, mum, I'm uh, I'm off to a party actually." What the fuck? Why? <laughs> I, what yeah, the no, fuck? I knew this is going to be a reaction. I... Mum says, "Do you want any dinner?" He says, oh, well, I'll have a bit of food with us, but I'm just going to be a, friend, a few friends. So don't worry, I won't be drinking or anything like that. No, he's not, but he's going to be doing bongs till the cows come home. Um, and he, she says, all right, that's fine. Just take your sister with you, OK? What? 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 So, Mum, so, Mum what do you want me to do? Can you take your 12-year-old sister with you? Why? Just uh, do it. Because, go see if she wants to go. She, she'd be better out the house now. She's 12. Why isn't she staying here with you guys and hanging out with you? Why the fuck is she coming to a fucking party with me? Oh, it'd be good for her. No, it won't. Why is this going to be good for her? Oh, and don't worry. Let's not talk about the EpiPen and the nut allergy. Off you go. The worst thing is when she I says, Charlie. Hand, the worst thing is when she's like, I'm going to go to bed and then later on just goes to bed. But doesn't, they're supposed to be, you'd expect her to be up saying you need to be back at 10 o'clock because you've got your 12 year old fucking sister with you for some random reason. Well, uh, and I'm going to wait for her to get home. No, I'm just going to go to bed. What? Charlie doesn't even want to go when they ask her. She Shit says parenting. no. Charlie says no, I don't want to go. And she's like, well, you're going to go with your brother anyway because it'll be good for you. How is that good? He doesn't want to take her. <laughs> she doesn't want to go. No, the mum's Just making them. Is it? Let him the go mom... and get stoned. The, the only way I can see it, it but it doesn't come across cro properly, if the f reason for her to do that is because she's had enough and she needs a bit of space away from children, that needs to be defined more clearly. But this does come up later on in an argument which we'll, we'll come to, um, which is very a good point. But it but, did frustrate me because I was like, totally. what the fuck? I wouldn't do that. Totally. Um, and when we get to this party, because Pete As drives the them there. Yes, sir. Pete drives them there. All the way there. Have and a drink, ladies and gentlemen, every time Dan does that. When they get to the party, I've written down here, and I believe this is what the kids these days say, the party is lit. It's fucking lit. Um, this on party the, is on going the, off. On the way to the lit party, uh, they do go by a telegraph pole. It's got a little It's the same one. It's got, on it. got that symbol, isn't it? Yeah, yeah a little symbol. Yep. Um, so we get to the party. The first thing we see when they walk in is a girl chopping up nuts. And she's making a big old chocolate and nut cake. Wicked. I've brought my 12-year-old uh, sister, who I didn't want to bring, who didn't want to come here. She's got a nice nut allergy, which could kill her. They're excellent. Brilliant. You know. This, I should also imagine there's an extra ingredient in this chocolate and nut cake. I should imagine there's a shitload of weed in there as well, which is probably going to trigger Charlie when she eats this cake in a moment. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I think, don't, I, I don't, I don't even think... Yeah, I think so, because she yeah. sort of has a funny reaction. Um, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the peanuts, isn't it? Pete, Pete talks to a girl at the party, the one that he's been Facebook stalking. and uh, Pete basically gets into the party and says, look, there's cake over there, go eat cake. I'm going upstairs to try and get get some fingering going on, and I'm going to smoke some bongs. Like, just fuck off over there. Just stay sister. down here for about 45 minutes. Jesus that's Christ. all I need. Yeah. So he talks to this girl and he says to her, I've got some weed. And she goes, well, there's a bong in the other room. So he goes in the other room with his, her and some other guys. And they start getting packing a bong out, getting getting ready to get into some Cheech and Chong shit. Meanwhile, Charlie manages to get some chocolate cake. And starts, starts drawing, to meet... Just goes and draws. She starts feeling ill after a while. She grabs some water and her throat feels tight and she's not... Really having a good time. Susan finds her brother who's smoking some bongs and says, I don't feel well. Yeah, and, and he, he's a big brother at the end of the day. And he knows, yeah, of course he is, and he still loves her, of course he does. And he knows what's going on straight away. Again, why is the mum not said, take that, or, you know, like... Urgh. Well, he carries her out to the car. He's a brilliant, like I said, his character is fantastic. She's struggling in this. to breathe because her throat's like... Uh, expanded. He goes to the car, he puts his foot down and they drive and he lies her in the back seat and he says to her, he's very stoned as well, and he says to her, look, um, I'm going to get you straight, I'm not even going to go home, we're going to go straight to hospital, um, don't worry about it, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure you're okay. And she starts having a fit in the back of the car. Um, because of this, she needs some air. So she, it's very sadly, <laughs> puts her head out the window. And while she does this, Pete swerves around some roadkill and 
pal. Yeah. No. Um, um, this is more here for the next moment or so, isn't it? It's quite impacting, obviously, because this little girl's like struggling to breathe, puts her head out the window, and then he fucking hits a telegraph pole so we know what's happened. And it's just like that. Oh, I don't. One of my big no nos are yeah, my head's being popped off. It's not. It's not. It's, it's a kid as well. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> It's an incredible scene here. What what we see now is just the an external shot of the car slowing down. I was a, I remember smoking when I was at college, and I smoked a bong for the first time I ever smoked a bong, and it was a, a I was between a lesson, and I drove back to school, obviously uh, college, um, and uh, drove about two miles an hour all the way. Apparently, I had a big traffic jam behind. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very bad, and I don't recommend you do stuff like that. It's don't a, smoke it's and drive. It's illegal, really, isn't it? You shouldn't do stuff like that. And um, But if I'd also done that, and also at two miles an hour, I wouldn't be able to pop someone's head off. They'd just slowly no. rub their face over it. <laughs> <laughs> Get some staples and splitters in their face. But if I had, and the state I must have been in to be driving so slow, uh, that would have fucked me up royally, which it does him, because he then decides to drive home very slowly and go to bed. Well, before he does that, just to say, so the way that we, his, the representation of, of how he's dealing with this or trying to process what's potentially just happened is that we see the car slow down and then we cut back into the car and he starts to look in the rearview mirror, but he, he cannot bring himself to do that. Then he, he says... That's the first thing he knows what's happened. Oh. He sort of says, I think he says, Charlie, and there's obviously no answer. And so, yeah, he then drives slowly home. He is comatose at this point well not comatose uh, catatonic that's the word gets yeah. home goes to bed turns off the engine marches up the stairs gets into bed and doesn't sleep all night he's just sort of led yeah, over his eyes imagine open. he's gonna sleep all night he's just gonna be fucking sitting there just rolling over that whole thing over and over and over in his head until and he then... hears screams from his mother again though why are the parents in bed? The twelve well, sisters hear them, gone out. Well, you uh, hear them in the morning get up very faintly in the background. Morning, morning. Oh, what are you up to, lovely? I'm just going to pop to the shop and buy some more bits for my model. It opens in a minute, so I'm going to leave early. Okay, great. All right, I'll see you soon. Can you make sure the kids are up? Yep. Then you hear do 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 downstairs. Then the garage door open. Then the car door open. And then you just hear Annie. Oh my God. <laughs> And she just loses it, and she's discovered the headless corpse in the back of the car. It's, it's, straight away, you're going to obviously think it's like a fucking joke. You're not going to think, oh, that's my kid in there without a head. You must be like, first, like, you know. But but it's just, <laughs> how goddamn traumatic is that? And then we, what about this hard cut, Gav? Oh, so straight the head at the side of the road with flies and everything on it. It's just, just like, oh, my God. Co it's covered in ants and flies. Um, oh. And then we cut back to Annie. Being comforted by uh, uh, Gabrielle Byrne, just crying but, away on the floor. She, what she's saying here, she's saying, I want to die. I just need to die. Please kill me. Please, I don't want this to be real. I want to die. My God, the grief pouring out of her the disbelief of what she's seen. Now, she buried her mum a week ago. So now this has happened. And, and not just, it's not even just a normal death. A, it's the death of a child. B, you found her without a head. It's I don't just... I know how you would cope with that, to be honest with you. It's just... I would, Pete... I would lose my mind. And Pete is like a zombie. He's just lying there in the bed listening to all this, knowing he probably wants to die as well. He probably cannot believe... That this is his fault, bet you know. And it, although bet he won't be smoking a bong anytime soon. Although it wasn't, an, it wasn't, it was an accident. Oh, no, he's sorts. smoking joints a, a few days later, isn't he? At school. Oh yeah, he goes harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an accident, obviously. Yes, yeah, the same as his mum when she does speak to him finally, she knows it's an accident. But like, still, do you know what I mean? It's a film. Well, we cut to Charlie's funeral, and mum is just screaming as the coffin's been lowered into the ground. Um, and the camera pa nicely pans down through the turf, through the dirt oh, the underground. Okay, yeah. Nice little. And then we cut back to the wake. Um, yeah. And it's a very solemn affair, as you can imagine, because it's a 12-year-old girl's wake. No one's really talking. 
no one's talking to Pete. Pete barely comes in the room. Annie doesn't even come downstairs. She's lying on the bed, just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Gabrielle Bruno's the dad trying to just be like the person trying to now hold the family together. Must be like, oh my god, is you know. I I can relate to. I know you. I don't know if it's old school or fashioned. It's like, I must step up now. Man of the house or something. I suppose it's a bit old fashioned, really. If it was the other way around, the the, uh, the woman, regardless of sex, would step up and take over. But yeah, I, I do, what are you going to say? I was just going to say I, I really relate to all three main characters in this. Obviously, well, not scenarios. Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I can relate to Pete and his grief and his how he feels. I can relate to Annie and her grief, but I can also relate to Gabriel Byrne trying to yeah trying to hold it together as best you can. You know, no, no. Oh, my mind would break. Yeah, and he does eventually give up later on in the movie you know you just can't go on doing this anymore but but yeah it's uh i've realized of recently also with jay's autism diagnosis and me thinking now i pretty 100 percent have adhd uh, and then looking into adhd and the symptoms and stuff and just um one from being stressed i've realized pretty much everything i do in life is completely stress-free all the choices i've made like work-wise, where I live, a lot of things. I'm trying to do as much as I can to not stress because I think my mind breaks too easily. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, and that's if you can. I think I've, I think if I've you can live right, like that. Then I, I think I've got the right thing going on here. I don't get stressed too easily, uh, uh, too often. I do get stressed easily. That's the problem, very often. So I think I've kind of got it down to a T at the moment. Touch wood. Um, Pete has a panic attack when he's smoking weed with his buddies. I'm not surprised. I would probably stop smoking weed, to be honest with you. I don't think that is going to be helping. Annie tries to go to grief counselling and decides, can't do this. So she walks away. But as she walks away, a lady called Joan, old lovely Joan, says, Oh, excuse me, lovely, are you going to come in? I did see you a few weeks ago. Um, who, who is it you lost? And she says, well, I originally came back my mum, but my daughter was killed last week. So mm. that's another reason I'm here. <laughs> Bloody hell. So Joan's like, well, my son and my uh, grandson both drowned together two years ago. Um, so that's why I'm here. So I should imagine her grandson was drowning and her son jumped in to save him and they both drowned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I imagined it as well. And it's pretty full on really, isn't it? Joan is a lovely lady, and they chat to her, and she says, look, just take my number. If you ever need to talk to me, you know, you don't even have to come and talk in the class. We can just go for a coffee or something. But either way, it's important that you talk to people. And she seems lovely. Um, Going back very quickly to P. having to smoke with his buddies, when he starts to panic, um, he starts to not, almost not be able to breathe. And I didn't know if that was a symbolization of um, uh, how Charlie was with the peanut allergy when she started taking over. Yeah, maybe. That's what I thought that was. Or maybe there's something in the weed. Oh, that's what that was, I think. Because um, okay. the, the other people are smoking the weed, and it's not happening to them. Yeah, but they're, they're also, all those people are in the treehouse at the end as part of the cult. Oh. <laughs> really? Yep. Tell me these things. Tell well, the audience. I'm telling you now. Well, good. <laughs> A lot of the people at Tony, Tony Collette's mum's funeral are in that treehouse. Okay. And okay. we're going to see them all see, naked. Just... <laughs> yeah, but that's why you don't even know who they are. So for me, I never realised that. I didn't notice that uh, the people from the area on we've met. This is what I'm saying. This is my third watch now, oh, and this is my third noticing these things. Okay. So, yeah. And when, um, she, get, when she gets home, though, she's keeping it a secret from her husband that she's going to these meetings. So yes. She's going to the cinema. He knows that that's bollocks. He probably doesn't know where she's going, but whatever. If it makes it easier for her, whatever. He knows she's not bloody going to the cinema. Well, she's been sleeping in the treehouse as well, because that was where Charlie used to try and go and sleep. Yeah. And her and her husband just aren't really sleeping in the bed together anymore. Um, it's all fallen apart, really. I don't know if I'd let my 12-year-old, 12, 12 possibly autistic child uh, uh, go sleep in a treehouse. What if she fucking just falls out? Especially with all the woods they've got around there. <laughs> just, I know. It's not safe. <laughs> you're staying in there, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I know you've got your thing, and like, if you don't get your way, it's a thing, I understand, but that's not a thing, because it's dangerous. <laughs> I'll bring you all the pigeon heads you want yeah, to you your room. Have, you can have one massive pigeon head made out of paper mache, if you like. A paper mache pigeon head. <laughs> um, Pete wakes up in the night, terrified, because he sees someone in his chair. 
in his room. Having a little wank. It's Jimmy Savile. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it's not. It's fine. It's just some clothes on the chair. We've all done it. We've all woken up in the night and seen something in the corner. Now and then realised realize it's just our old pants on top of the... Uh, Armchair in the corner. It's How many not really... pairs of pants have you got to form a human being in your chair? <laughs> did you just did you wait until you've got like eighty pairs of pants and you do a big pant wash? Yeah. <laughs> I w- yeah. I, I, then I burn them all and then start again. You have a big pant burn off session. Pant burn like a sacrifice. Um, Annie's exhibit is looming. She keeps getting phone calls and emails, and she is nowhere gods. near. She's nowhere near ready to display her models to this, whoever it is. So she decides to go and meet Joan. Joan says, just come to my house. It's fine. Come on over. She gets there and she sees the same welcome mat as the one her mum's got. And she thinks, that's strange. It's got that symbol on it that I recognise. That's weird. Same symbol, girl, that was on that pole earlier. Spooky. Um, And she breaks down to Joan. Um, and says, you know, she basically describes what it was like to find the body in quite a graphic detail. She says, you know, I, I couldn't believe it was my daughter's body, but I knew it was her body, but I couldn't tell because I couldn't see her face. She had no head. And the way she's describing it is just like, it's so heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah, crying away. Yeah. Um, she takes a pill because she's now taking pills. And this is where she tells. Some, she t- is this where you can say she tells about uh, her sleepwalking she did once. Yes, but her also she she drinks her drink that Jones prepared her that's got something in it, which ah. was the same the same something that was in the weed. Um, ah, I see. So the family is being controlled like toys in a dollhouse, Gav. A, a la the the dolls' houses that Tony Coletti is making. And she's asked, "What's her relationship with Peter like?" And she says that once upon a time she uh, oh my was God, sleepwalking is, and found just... herself just just uh, just about to uh, 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 f- set him on fire and herself um, basically put uh, paint thinner all over him and um, herself and uh, was striking a match and woke up to him saying, "Mum, what are you doing?" And uh, but she's like, "I instantly blow up the match." <laughs> well done. And well they still done. think I was going to, you know, I was doing it on purpose. But I swear to them, I was sleepwalking. Now, funny that you've done that, because my notes say, ask Gav about the paint thinner story, which, so you've done it. Yeah. So, yeah, she poured paint thinner all over Pete while he was sleeping, while she was sleepwalking, and almost set him on fire. So that's interesting. Yep. (laughs) Um, Gabriel Byrne tries to talk to Pete, and then he tries to talk to Tony Collette, and Pete says, she won't even look at me. She hates me. Tony Collette doesn't really want to talk about it. Before um, dinner, very quickly, uh, uh, Gary O'Brien goes up to Satella when dinner's ready, and uh, she's there uh, making uh, a replica of the scene from her from the car accident with uh, with a little head and everything. Yep. He says to her, "Jesus Christ, Danny," and she says, "Look, it's my way of dealing with it," which I get, and that's fine. But he says, "For God's sake, don't let Peter see this." He's already hanging on by a, by a thread. I understand from all sides. But poor Peter, if, imagine if he'd seen that. It's a bit full on. We have one of my favourite scenes now, the dinner scene. It's not a supernatural scene in any way. There's no gore in it or anything. It's just an incredibly acted, very emotional scene that well, goes through well, sadness, it, anger... Gabriel Byrne's trying to just go back to just have it. He just wants... It's like... I just want to get laid every once in a while. I just want to ha- go to work, come home, we eat some nice food. My, my child's getting an education. Everything's all right. I, I cut the lawn. I pay my taxes. He, he just wants a fucking normal life. So he gets his son saying to him, oh, g- nice meal, Dad. Said, oh, thanks. So just then, just just at that moment, it all goes out the window. Everything in this whole movie, this whole massive depression cloud goes out the window for that second. It's just normal. Then straight before him. <laughs> She, she yeah, laughs at, because she laughs he, at the comment. Well, she, yeah, because he, him, and Peter are getting on okay. Because they're trying Gabriel to, Byrne, they're try, they know everybody knows, so they're trying to just. That's just. Be he's been nice. People. He's been a dad to it's his just son, be and he's humans and carry on. I know it's obviously you can't just carry on without thinking that. Oh, 
there's someone missing from the dinner table. It's fucking ridiculous. But let's try and do something, and that's what yeah. they're trying to do. But all the while they're having these lovely little backwards and forwards about the food, you can she, she feel laughs. you can feel the hate coming the, off the of cloud her. <laughs> comes yeah. back into the room. Yeah. And Pete says, "Is there something wrong, Mum?" He thinks I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. ask you about okay? this. Are you okay? Like it's, you know, and it's. And I, Dad again, says, "Look, though, I understand from where she's coming from. I understand." Well, Dad says to her, "Look, Dad says Pete, don't don't push it. Come on." And he he says, "No, no, Mum. Like you won't even look at me anymore. Okay. Uh, like, well, can you just talk to me?" And they get into this. She she says, "I don't really want to talk to you," but eventually she stands up and screams lots of dialogue at him, which essentially is, your sister is gone, okay? She's gone forever because of you. You need to take some fucking responsibility. You know, I cannot forgive. I cannot forget. I want to. You're my son. And yes, deep down, I do love you. But I cannot forgive you. And I cannot forget what's happened. Your sister is gone. She says, I understand it was an accident. I understand that. But yeah, she's gone. And yeah, I get that. I get that. But then... From both sides. But then he flips it because he lets that sit for a good 10 seconds and he says, and what about you, mum? And she looks up like, what? And he says, you're the one that wanted her to go to the party. Yeah. You're the one that made me take her to the party. She didn't want to go. No. I didn't want to take her. No. What about you, mum? Do you yeah. have any responsibility in this? Yeah. And that... Dad then is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let's stop this right here. Ding, it's, ding, ding. It's quite valid. I agree. And, you know, he's... If I had an EpiPen, this wouldn't have happened either. <laughs> oh, and then my next line just says, poor, poor, poor Gabriel Byrne. <sighs> poor Gabriel. I just want to give him a hug. I want to take him out for a whiskey and a cigarette and just get, put my arm around him and go, look, it's been a bit of shit a few weeks for you. Just have a couple of drinks with me. There's a, there's a glory hole in the bathroom. Oh, my God. What, are you going to suck him off? <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Why not? I'm, I'm, because I don't want... What do you mean, why not? I didn't want to suck Gabriel Byrne off. <laughs> no point has that ever triggered in my mind. Ever. <laughs> I'm saying... I'll say, Gabriel, get some whiskeys down, yeah? Go on. There's a glory hole back there. Go see what happens. You know? I hope our patron, Don, is happy that at this point in the deep dive, we are now covering potentially sucking off Gabriel Byrne through a glory hole. <laughs> Gabriel, Gabriel Byrne and the glory hole. That's, yeah. the, that's the name of my new uh, autobiography. No, that's it's a, not. That's it's a not mine. It's not my autobiography. Someone else's who he meets in the bathroom. Anyway, if we go back to Joan's house... Um, uh, oh, she bumps into Joan at the art store, where Joan is buying chalkboards. Hmm, interesting. Um, and she says, look, I want to talk to you about this. I went to see a medium. It was a seance. And don't just hear me out, because this is going to sound crazy. But I spoke to my grandson, and I feel at peace, and it's all fine now. Come back to my house. Just come back to my house. I'll show you exactly what I mean. So and, and I, I, I did I did one medium session and now I am a medium. <laughs> Fuck off, are you? I'll teach you, will you? It's a little domino effect. Is it like the cold? You touch me and I've got it. Fuck off. So she goes back to Jane's house and they they turn out the can they turn out the lights and they light a candle and they have a seance and she talks to her grandson and the glass moves first of all that they're, they're touching. Um, classic, and then some, boredness. but then something blows through Tony Collette's hair, and that's quite a spooky moment. Um, and then, so she says, "Wait, wait, wait! What? Talk to Grandma through your chalkboard." So she gets this chalkboard, and this piece of chalk just starts writing on its own. And this actually made me really teary when it says, "Love you, Granny," because uh, I thought, "Oh, man, like." This little, it must have been a young boy that drained. I don't know, something about that just really, again, maybe it's because I'm a dad now as well. 
because I think the second time I watched this, I'd lost my mum. Now I, this is the third time watching this. Now I'm a dad. It's like it's hitting me on every time I watch this. There's a new level. That's why it's um <clears throat> it's very good to go back to films uh, as you grow older because you start seeing stuff differently. Like I totally relate to the dad, and then one day I'll be like the old people in National Lamp- Lampoon's Christmas Vacation at come for to stay at the house. I'll be one of those guys <laughs> farting away without knowing. Um, I was talking to our buddy RJ. Shout out to RJ. Shout out to um, RJ indeed. Uh, last night about this movie and about crying at things when you become a dad. And I said to him, one film I haven't watched yet since becoming a dad is the original Pet Cemetery. That's going to be a difficult one to watch. I yes, think. it is. <laughs> That's going to be a tough one to I watch. Think, I think, though, I've, I'm now into going into my 16 years of being a parent. So I actually think I've kind of gone past it. But initially, I'd say first first 10 years, I was pretty like when there's a child being killed on the field, because I was like, oh, my God! Like, <laughs> it just, I just stay avoided. Nowadays, not too bad now. Well, Annie leaves Joan's house very sort of speechless and scared. But Annie says, well, look, take this. This is the spell, or whatever it is. You've got to read this out, light a candle, get an object that's special to that person. If you do want to speak to your daughter, this is how you do it. So she drives home from Jones, and in the back of the car, it was a noise. That's weird. Um, she gets home. She sees spiders and ants, just like there were um, on on her daughter's decapitated head. Um, goes and to, goes uh, to Peter's room and has a little look. Peter, Peter dearest, how are you today? Oh, he's covered in bugs. Oh, covered in bugs today, are you? But then she snaps out of it and she realises that she's been sleepwalking and he stood over her. And it's quite a nice scene now because obviously the last time his mum slept walking, he woke up, she was about to set him on fire. Yeah. This time she says, he says to her straight away, why are you scared of me? And she says, I never wanted to be your mother. <gasps> I didn't mean that. But then she kind of sort of says a few more words and he then she reveals I actually tried to just lose you I tried to have a miscarriage threw myself even, downstairs even worse I He's tried like, what? how did you times. how how and she's like everywhere I could everything they told me I shouldn't do I did and then he what starts going, the shit why did you try to kill me mummy why did you try to kill me and then the flames hit in and then she wakes up and it's all been a dream Thank fuck, because that was an intense fucking dream. All she needed next was to open the curtains and a werewolf Nazi zombie to come flying out. Yeah, totally. Dream within a dream. Oh, anyway, just catch my breath after that. Anyway, she she runs into Peter's room and she this is like an epiphany now. She hugs him and she apologizes to him and says, I know it wasn't your fault. And then she runs in and wakes her husband up and says, Everybody, everybody, it's 2 a.m. It's, it's Christmas s- Day. It's seance time. Fucking hell. Um, just for one second, we get her rushing to the sun to say, I forgive you, I'm so sorry. Just for a second, he's probably like, Oh, that gives me this. Even though I can't bring my sister back, that gives me a little bit of like, oh, thank you, like we could, our power of love between us. We can, we can, you know, no, no. Oh, what's that, Mum? <laughs> Seance. You're saying you're a medium now. What? what? <laughs> you will come on. We all need to be a part of this. And Gabriel Bird is brilliant in this. He's like, this is ridiculous. This, I'm going back to bed. This, you, you need some help. She's like, no, 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 no. Just stay. Just stay. It's going to be great, honestly. Mm. We're going to speak to Charlie. God. And they're like, what? Uh, and while they're getting ready, Pete does hear a little creak in the house. Now, that is because there's one of the coal in the house. Um, so all these shapes that are in the bedrooms at night, these are the cult members. So when they think they see somebody, they actually do, but it's not a ghost. What it's are one they of doing? The Just stood there naked like they are towards the end. Doing what? Are they, are they working shifts? What happens? Yeah, they do. They work in just. I've got the um, two till two a.m. to six a.m. shift tonight, guys. Then I'm back home sleeping, but I'm going to have some lunch first. We're all, we're all having ham sandwiches round the corner naked. John, John, don't forget. Last night when you did your shift, you kept your socks on. You've got to be fully naked when you stand in the corner of Pete's room. All right, that's the job description. I'm sorry. I'm Frank, sorry. I had cold Frank, feet. Frank, you need to wipe better. You've left marks everywhere on the curtains in Pete's room. <laughs> There was a, a streak. God's sake, Frank. 
he can see he can see uh, uh, Annie just going to, just cleaning up the house next day going, what's on Brown Street going down I don't get what's going what's on it, oh, oh. is this Marmite no it's not so they want to speak to well they don't want to but Annie wants to speak to Charlie um, so they all touch the glass and the glass moves freaks them out a bit um, then they get Charlie's sketchbook and she says she drew pictures for me earlier and I wanted to draw a picture for you guys as well and this is where Gabriel Byrne stops it for he fuck's says, no. sake he says he says this is ridiculous we're ending she this begs now him, though. she does Peter starts crying because he's watching his mum fully Break down melt and down in front of him and he's on- and his mind's already broken from what he's done to his sister. It's exactly the same as in Poltergeist. The elder sister breaks down as a sideline watching what's going on. Yep. Repeatedly I, in I that thought, movie, she does the same. There's actually a lot of the comparisons same, between the two. Some parallels uh, going on with these dimensions. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so then suddenly Annie becomes possessed. Yeah, Charlie, are you here? She says, you know. And then she says, Mummy? What's going on? Daddy, you're here. Pete, Pete. Pete's crying. He's saying, Dad, make it stop. Because your mum is talking with your sister's voice. What the shit? Come Uh, on, now. I was literally in bed having a wank, like, 45 minutes ago. What the fuck am I now doing here, down here? Mum's dead daughter, uh, dead sister. What the fuck? This is horrible. (laughs) I want to go back to bed. Um, Candle lights by itself. Candle does light by itself, and I can't remember how this ends really. Well, now. This, well, as this goes on, though, it makes it so more intense. It basically cuts back and forwards of close ups of their faces, so it's just really claustrophobic. And the cut back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to reaction. It's like, oh my god, oh, that's right. And then Gabriel Byrne just throws water on her, yeah, just whoosh, and we stop that scene. Like, oh my god, and Pete, Pete runs off to bed crying, and Gabriel Byrne's is very it's cross, intense. The next day in, in class, Pete. He's pretty much catatonic, and he sees those strange lights in the class. But she saw them earlier, so that means that is death coming. It means the demon is is watching them. It's yeah. chosen them, and it's not his death though, is it? Cool, it's not because he becomes king, king, uh, whatever, king bong. <laughs> when the fuck he comes? Um, well, I've got it written down, like that, so we'll have a look at that in a minute. But um, Steve is very cross with Annie, and he phones her up. Um, sort of says, you know, this is not good enough. You can't can't do this to our son um, and to me. Um, and then Annie gets a phone call from the gallery. And the deadline is pretty much any day now. So she decides, look, I'm very close to getting ready. They say, though, we can postpone the show if you want, because obviously your yeah. daughter's fucking head was lopped off. You know, you definitely can have some time off. I'm more than, you know, willing to give you some extra time. No, no, it's all right. What I'll do is I'll just smash up every fucking model I've ever made to pieces. Brilliant. That'll do it. So she smashes them all up. So Steve gets home from work. Daddy gets home from work. And he sees all the models smash the pieces. Yep. And he just goes downstairs and he pours himself a drink. It's a bit like that bit in um, The Colour Out of Space where it's all going absolutely fucking crazy and Nicholas Cage just thinks I was going to pour myself a nice whiskey yeah just pour this one out right here sit down drink it I want Gabriel Byrne to pour, pull out a drink then pull out his top pocket a phone number which says uh, a dirty phone number like when you're <laughs> out of school <laughs> it'll be your note somehow and he sits down and what? picks up the phone I do, and then my phone rings oh, like, weird Hi, is this Dan's glory hole? <laughs> Have you got a satisfied Gabriel Byrne again? <laughs> what is it with Gabriel Byrne getting satisfied on this show? <laughs> because we feel so sorry for him in this movie. I think so. I think so. I just want some relief for him. <laughs> we cut to Charlie's sketchbook, which is drawing pictures on it. It's sort of flip, flipping through pages on its own. And there's pictures in there. Um, Peter wakes up in the night and sees his sister and then her head falls off and rolls towards him. Fucking hell. That scene is just not just needed. If, yeah, it's just, not, the scene's not, you know, just having that. If that was your 
thing you were having in your dreams. Fuck. The worst, the worst thing is it then turns into just a ball, so it then becomes like the scene from The Changeling. It's just like, oh, my God, this is just terrifying. Yeah, a really creepy movie, this, all the way through. Really creepy. Um, the dog is a bit scared as well. They've got a doggo we should have mentioned, um, and dog's not really very happy about it, about it either. Um, then suddenly some hands grab him and try and pull his head off. Yeah. Uh, and he thinks it's his mum trying blames, to attack him. He blames his mum, yeah. Yeah. So Annie tries to burn the book, but her arm catches on fire. So the book of uh, the, the sketchbook, but her arm catches on fire. Well, she says, I can stop this. And yeah, she goes to burn the book, but um, she has to pull it out the fire because it sets her on fire. So she she um, she th- thinks the only way to do it is if someone else throws the book in the fire. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, Pete's at school. And uh But he's getting a lot of education at this moment. <laughs> he's just sat there dri- dribbling. Well, he's literally dribbling, isn't he? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. He's, he's fucked. Uh he sees a woman across the road, um, while he's in the playground, it says uh, I've chosen you, I expel you, Peter, I expel you Basically meaning you leave your body and somebody else is gonna come into your body in a minute. And he's like, What is going on? Am I seeing these things? Um while that's going on, and we'll come back to Pete in a minute, because he's about to have a bit of a headbanging experience at school, Annie goes back to see Joan, and Joan's apartment is emptied. There's no one there. It's just very strange. So she goes and looks through her mum's stuff, the box of all of her mum's stuff, and finds a welcome mat, the same welcome mat that was outside Joan's. She also finds um, lots of things that have that symbol on them, she finds something to indicate that she'd written Charles instead of Charlie, meaning that she really did want Charlie to be a boy. And there's a reason for that, which is that they want the firstborn son, um, I believe, to so they can take over um, with the demon. So there's lots of stuff that she finds in this box, which throws her off a bit. But cut back to Pete. He's at his desk, isn't he, Gav? Yep. Sees a little reflection in the mirror. He's smiling. Well, he's thinking, I'm not smiling, so why am I, Why is my reflection smiling at me? All of a sudden, starts having a crazy... So he turns into the girl from The Grudge. His arm goes up in the air. His <laughs> neck starts going clicking over. The weird thing, then headbutts the, uh, the old desk in front of him. <clears throat> now, he asked Ari Aster, can I... Do you mind if I... This is true. This is a piece of trivia. I'm, I'm going to break my nose on this desk do you mind for this scene and Ariasta said look I don't want you doing that what we'll do is this is a film <laughs> you don't need to do that this is a film we will prepare a desk with a piece of foam on it um, so you can break you know smash your head down on it but it's not going to hurt however Alex Wolf didn't realise that the bit he headbutted wasn't it was only half the desk that was foam so he ended up dislocating his jaw, but he already had a bad dislocation on a jaw from years ago. So he, he, he quite commonly can dislocate his jaw if he gets hit hard enough. So he dislocated his jaw, smashing his head down onto that desk. Yeah. Pretty weird, isn't it? Anyway, that freaks out everybody in class. Come on, um, actors. You don't need to actually break your nose to, 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 to when you're in character. We can, we can work around it. And, uh, it's like when Shia LaBeouf's just, character... Too much. Shia LaBeouf's character in that Tank film with Brad Pitt when he said uh, so my my character um, doesn't have any teeth? No, that's right. Okay, cool. See you on Monday for the more shoot. And when he turned up to set on the Monday, he'd ripped out two or three of his own teeth with a pair of pliers. Just get makeup to do it or get it in CGI. Yeah, just get a couple of little black cap put on it. You can hide it. Shia LaBeouf. What the fuck? Sometimes, anyway. like, sometimes when people do that, it's literally a bit like, yeah, you, don't, you know you don't need to do that. Are you just trying to be super cool? Like, what, what the hell's... What's with that? And going back to Ali, going through her mum's boxes, she finds some books about possession, and she finds a photo album, and in this photo album is... Dun, 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 pictures of her mum and Joan hanging out. Uh, where at some party, some gathering, where her mum is quite clearly the queen uh, of this 
whatever this group of people is. And we find out later on she is the queen of the cult, her mum. And she's like, what the fuck? Joan never mentioned that she knew my mum. This is crazy. So she goes home. She goes in the attic. Going to go look for some Christmas presents. She's going to do a, a Griswold here. <laughs> Chevy Chase again. Um, but instead of finding a lovely little reel-to-reel with some family memories on it, she finds her mum's headless body lying yeah. on the floor. Brilliant. <laughs> with with writing on the wall, uh, symbols, and Ooh, flies buzzing all over it. Now, lovely. you know, listen, Gav, what I will say is, any time yeah. you're about to go in an attic, if you open that attic hatch and you hear the, buzz, the buzzing of flies, yeah. don't go in there. Do not go in there. Something is dead. I've seen many a horror movie, so there's occasionally in life I have choices, and sometimes they're determined from the previous horror films I've seen. Yeah. Gabriel uh, Burns. It, Gabriel Burns now actually it, it finally breaks down. He has a little cry in the car. He, he does. He, that's it. He's gone. He's off to the glory hole now. <laughs> If that's uh, if that's what uh, another word word in for breaking of the mind, then yes, he does. The it, it's, a, it's a very good scene because his character it doesn't say a lot, but is there any pubs called the Glory Hole? I doubt it. There must have been a bar or pub called the Glory Hole. Maybe a gay Hole. bar, yeah. But yeah, but if it wasn't, they didn't know, and it's, it's called the Glory Hole. What, some up in Yorkshire? Some, uh, hey, mate, you're coming down Glory Hole later on for a pint. I'm going down the Glory Hole for a pint. I see you in Glorio. Give me a pint and I'll get you a pint. Um, yeah, so he goes to pick Peter up from school because Peter's broken his nose. Um, and he gets home and Annie is manic. Um, Great. It's what he wants, isn't it? He he's says, I thinking, don't... As he pulled up, he was probably thinking, right, there's going to be options of what she's A, B or C. <laughs> she could be doing either of these random things. What's it going to uh, be? Well, he says to her, look, for fuck's sake, don't, before anything, just help me get our son in the house. So they pick him up and they carry him and put him in his bed. Yeah, that, before, I've said this to the kids before, like, can you not just tell me this shit now, please? Can you do this next weekend? I don't need more, because there's something that the other day that we've got something we were talking about. We did, we've wondered to tell you about it or not. So can we, and I was like, I've got too much in my mind. Can it be the next time I see you? <laughs> Just say no, All no right, more. Yeah. No and then a week, more. a week later, you're like, okay, what was that thing you were yeah, going to tell no, me last week? I've taken some things in my mind, some problems you've caused me. What problem is it now? <laughs> oh, it's a dead body in the attic. <laughs> yeah, but fucking hell. So she tells them about Luckily, it. Luckily, well, she's not said that. She sends them up there, um, because uh, we as an audience are like, that's probably not going to be up there when he goes up there. Yeah, everybody was like... It's not going to be there. And he's going to say, it's not there. You're going crazy. He's probably hoping he's not going to find a body in the attic. But as soon as he goes up there and opens it, we hear the flies. So we're like, oh, no. And he goes up there and he's like, Jesus Christ, who was that? It looked like your mother. Oh, my God. How does that look like her mum? Have you seen it? Because he saw mum in her funeral gown in the open coffin. So it was that was what she was wearing. Hmm. Also, he's pictured his mum, I remember that head loads of times, so I should imagine. He blames her for digging up the body. You dig yeah, he up does. the body! Well, which says, could be the first, your first choice of what you're doing. But he says to her, why haven't you told the police? I think you've done this. Um, all those times you said you were going to the theatre, I don't think you were. Um, she says, listen, listen, um, look at this picture of Joan. They've got matching necklaces, mm. uh, and it's the same symbol that's on the wall up there. He doesn't, but he just thinks this is apt. My wife has lost it. She's dug up her mum's dead body. I, I don't know what else is, she's going to do. We need, I need to get my son and me away from this situation. But she says, I think this is a curse, and it's, it's after Peter in some way. Um, and what we need to do is we need to burn the book, um, but it won't let me burn it, because when I tried to burn the book, it set me on fire. And he's thinking, she's had too many tablets or something here. <laughs> Yeah. And she says, only Gabriel burn. Only Gabriel can burn Ooh. the book. Do you see what I did there? Yeah. Um, she begs him. Do you, she, um, do you reckon when she's about to, about to before action? Hold up before we go, before we go, roll. Your surname's burn, isn't it? And you could be the one that burns it. Okay, we can carry on. <clears throat> 
Well, not only that, but it, Gabriel does actually burn as well because Gabriel burn. The book gets thrown on the fire, and he immediately catches on fire and just stands there burning. Um, it's an amazing piece of acting from Tony Coletti while she's having a breakdown. And, yeah, he's on fire and she's possessed. And Yeah. Now, poor old Peter, he's had a hell of a few months because his grandma died. He wasn't particularly close to. Then he accidentally killed his sister. Um, then his mum hates him. Gets up in the middle of the night. He thinks, what's going on? There's something downstairs. Can I smell something? Is someone cooking? Let's go and have a look. What's downstairs? Is it bacon? It smells like bacon. Could be sausages. Dad? Dad, what's that? Oh, my God, that's my dad's charred body lying on the living room floor. It's dad sausages. It's not great. No. It's really not great, is it? It's not good. It's not good. It's, it, it, you're, you're, you're in hell now, really, aren't you? Like, what the fuck now? Like, this your, mi- your mind is gone now. Yeah, there's no coming back. That's it. Um, he sees the child remains. Someone is on the ceiling above him, and it is Annie, and she is being a bit of a spider woman. The, the, yeah, at this point here, like the movies flip now straight away. Like now, you look up and you go, "What's she doing up there? What is? She, what? How is she up there? Why has she got this superpower come from? What the fuck?" She jumps down, and then we spot there's a naked old person in the doorway, Gav. So we've got some old man cock here. I was about to say, we love a bit of man, old, old man cock. We don't really love it. Well, you know, unless it's Gabriel Byrne. Um, yes, and Annie pounces, and she chases Charlie around the house, and run, he runs up into the attic. Bless him, it's not going to get any better for him, because he's about to see his grandma's dead body up there. <sighs> Poor kid. Um, this is a heartbreaking bit where she's banging on the door and he says, Mummy! Mummy! Like a, like a tiny baby. Um, he locks the door and then he, he suddenly notices there's candles lit everywhere. There's photos of him with his eyes burnt out. He's, uh, he's slapping sla- himself, isn't he? He's yeah. slapping over and over and over going, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up! Because it can't be real. It can't be real. Yeah, I, I can imagine that being like, this is, cannot be real. No, it is. And then he suddenly hears a noise behind him. Oh. And this is what um, Don was talking about in his email. Like, isn't it? And using piano wire, he sees his mum stood up in the beams of the attic, sawing, 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 sawing. Head comes off. Well, we don't see his head. her head come off. We hear it from the outside, don't we? Hmm. Which is nice. I always like it when they don't show it. You just hear a little thud. And he's just like, this is just not... What What could possibly happen now? Oh, look, there's a mass amount of naked people in this room. So what's the, the only thing I can actually think of doing is just running and jumping out that window. And I will, I will accept what happens. <laughs> so not only has he watched his mum saw her own head off, he realises there are a ton of old naked people around him. Yeah. So it's, it's, it could not get any worse, really, could it? No. Nope. So he jumps out the window. But it's okay, though, because he sees his uh, uh, mum floating up to the treehouse. Indeed. Now, something I didn't realise was that when he jumps out the window, Gav, hmm. he's dead. He, he gets killed. I did not know that. <clears throat> no, but he doesn't know. Uh, he's dead. How's he dead? Because he wakes up and sees his mum float up to the treehouse. Because that's not really happening. He's dead. What? So, so we see his mum's headless body float up to the treehouse. Yeah. And at this point now... So the he reason goes he's... up into the treehouse. Yeah, but that's because he is no longer Peter. He is dead. He is now the demon at this point. The demon's finally got him. Oh, okay. So that's why he goes up into the treehouse. And that's why he fully accepts everything that happens to him and he accepts his followers and finally the he's been expelled as that woman was shouting at him across the playground they finally killed him but kept the body intact enough that the demon could enter it so he goes up to the treehouse accepts his fate all the old naked people are in the bushes watching and smiling um he enters the treehouse he sees annie's head 
on top of a mannequin. That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. Like a tin sorry, Char- Charlie's head. Charlie's sorry, head. on, yeah, on top of a mannequin. Yeah. Some fairy lights around it. <clears> just a, like a Christmas tree, almost. It's lovely. Yeah. It's be- beautiful. And the cult start bowing down to him. Uh, then he sees his nanny's body and his mum's body, both with that head, positioned with their butts up in the air like they're praying. So that's, again, another... Thank God he's no longer him and he's the demon because this is all a bit much, really. Um, and he sees a picture of his grandma in the frame and he is crowned Paimon, the new the demon of the ninth level or whatever it is. Not eighth. Paimon, like a steak and kidney. No. But Payman, P A I M A N, who not is P-I-E. apparently Payman is the eighth king of hell, and he has crowned him. If he was Grand Payman, though, that would be quite cool too. It echoes Rosemary's Baby here, but rather than Hail Satan, they're all saying Hail Payman, Hail Payman, we brought you back, we brought you back, and it ends with just a little shot of his face looking, yeah, cool. I'm a payment now, I'm no longer Pete. One of the eight kings from hell. He, he, no, the eighth king of hell. Oh, sorry. So I don't know who the... I, I should imagine the first king of hell is probably Satan himself. What was don't his know first who, two, order three, four, of king? After they've done that, and they'll just do that all day long. They could get bored. They're going to need to eat, some clothes need, on. Yeah, yeah, some food. They just go close. So what does then King Payman do then? What's, what's his first port of order? I don't know. He's going to take over the world. Uh... I don't know, I was wondering what his first thing was. If it was me, I'd say, first of all, guys, I want cover a up smoothie. A bit. Cover up a bit. Go and get some clothes on. Secondly, yeah, get me a smoothie. Mm. And somebody get Domino's on the phone. Get mm. that delivered. Get some pizzas. But who's paying? Because um, none of you got clothes on, so none of you got a wallet. So what well, are we going to do about the pizza? May- maybe Payman can do that. But either way, we've come to the end of this fantastic journey into terror, grief, loss... Incredible acting. It's, it's not saying, "Oh, I fancy a happy movie today." Yeah, it's it's out there, but it is watch worth, a carry on movie. Yeah, it's not this. It is totally worth a watch. Totally worth your time, and I'm totally glad we covered it. Um, there's a lot more to it than what we've covered, but if you've watched this multiple times, you will notice lots of the cult members who are at the end in the treehouse. Um, you will notice them sort of spotted throughout the movie whether in the playground smoking weed with Pete at the party at the funeral at the beginning yeah I didn't realise um, and sense. like I said it took me three watches until I realised that he actually dies when he falls out the window of the attic and that's why everything becomes a little bit more dreamlike at that point because he's no longer Pete he's payment and that's how they kind of explain Tony Collette's body floating up into the it's just oh very unnerving and and i feel very uncomfortable watching it but it's such a well-made and crafted film that it gets an eight out of ten for me and a big 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 thumbs up mm, brilliant film i'm glad we could talk about it and look at it it's uh yeah it's really good to watch again uh as the reviewer um i hope you all enjoyed dan and i speaking about this film very very interesting uh give it a thumbs up if you've not seen it if you haven't seen it we've ruined it totally ruined it for you um but yeah, uh, do check out also uh, his follow-up film, Midsummer. That's a good good flick. Um, it is a bit long. It is um, a good one, though. Yeah, it's, uh, that's it's, his kind it's, of... A slow-burn summary movie. You get there, and I quite, I quite like it, personally. I know it's quite long, but I quite like it. Yeah, and it's that's kind of almost like his love letter to um, the Wicker Man, I would say. Hmm. That is in Whereas... that... I got it on Blu-ray uh, in that um, that massive pole of Blu-ray movies. Oh yeah, I sold about twenty-five of those on eBay. I got about a quid for each one. I was like, "Fuck's sake!" <laughs> <laughs> well, it dances with wolves, which came at twelve quid. Talking of glory holes, uh, Bill, Bill Murray is stood in the corner with a glory hole. He's made his own little one out of cardboard. He's just standing there in front of it. It's not going to work, Bill. It doesn't matter. You can see your little Billy. Cakes, make us some drinks. Thank you very much. Wash and whenever you're ready, <laughs> especially when you're handling those ice cubes, <laughs> don't rub them on your nip. Oh, my God. Bill Murray. There's such a little childish grin, though, doesn't he? Okay, Bill, do you want to take us into World of the Strange, please? For the love of God. 
Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Loud. Oh, Glory hole. Glory hole. So, thanks for that, Bill. You can go back over. The... Oh, please go back over there. Glory hole of the strange. It could be glory hole stories. I have two stories for us on this episode. I'm not going to say those words anymore in this episode. Good. Um, the first uh, story mm. involves involves a wolf man. Well, we all like a good wolf man, don't we? But not the kind of wolf man you're thinking about, Gav. <laughs> okay. Now, you may have seen me post this on the Facebook page, mm. some of you guys. I thought it would be worth exploring this story for those that didn't read it or didn't see it. I know where we're going with this, my friend. So I'll start with the headline. A bit weird. Um, a company which has turned a man into a dog for just under £13,000 has made a costume for a man of a wolf for £20,000 to turn him into a wolf. So this is like your tusk scenario here, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. This opens up multiple questions, really, doesn't it? <laughs> which have different stems coming off of each one. The company has created a hyper-realistic wolf costume. You may have heard about the man who recently had a dog suit made for him, but if you didn't, at least now you have. But the chances are that if you want it, there's a company called Zepit Workshop, and they will build it for you. Whatever you want, they will build it for you if you've got the money. They offer... Can I build, get him to build a Dan costume? Potentially. So it could look like you? Potentially. They offer a special service for people looking for escapism. Whether it's rolling around in the mud like a pig, dressing up as a dog. If you've got the money, they will build it for you. How does uh, it work when the you results... have this? Sorry, I can't... I've got to get into this. How does that work with this? if you have this as a fetish, this sort of thing? And then you can just... For that moment, you just go... Now I'm in... Cost, I guess it's like accidents or whatever. As soon as they get into... Or like when you have a lot of... Like a, a pinhead, for example. First time he looked in the mirror and, and he's left alone in his... In, in When they made Hellraiser, Doug Bradley? Doug Brad, Brady? Bradley? Yeah, Bradley. First time looking at himself, it's just like, oh my God. It's just like you have to sort of realise who you are and then you leave yourself at home because you're now the thing that everyone else sees. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Is that the same as this? So that as soon as you start rolling around in your own shit, you're just happy as anything. You don't worry about the dinner later, what I'm going to have for dinner, all the washing up, or picking up the kids from school. Yeah, I was fucking hell, I'm rolling around as a wolf in my own shit, or a dog or something, I mean, wolf shit. How's it well, the latest, Does that give you this, satisfaction? How's it work, Dan? Well, let's have a look. This, so this chap, their latest client, got in touch with them, and he said, look, will you guys, I've seen the dog costume you made for somebody, will you turn me into a wolf? They said... Yes, but it's going to cost. And he said, money's no object. And Incredible. They didn't, they didn't disappoint him. Uh, writing on their website, the unnamed customer wrote, because of my love of animals since childhood and seeing some realistic animal suits appear on TV, I dreamed of someday being a wolf. At the final fitting... I was amazed with my transformed self in the mirror. It was the moment when all my dreams came true. I was a wolf. Could you make the best werewolf movie ever with this costume? Have you seen it? Mm. It looks incredibly realistic. Yeah, I know. Does he then walk around on... Obviously, he walks along on all fours. No, he walks along on two legs. Do this is the worst. Do you want to <laughs> come on? You can't. You're not. If you go in there, you can't stop at ninety-seven percent and go. Oh, I'm not going to do that. The pictures of him are all sort of taken in a park. Now, if I was walking through the park in broad daylight yeah, and I saw this, I would fucking fours. shit myself. If I saw, because he's about six foot tall as it, well. It, it's not dog soldiers. You can't be just walking around. What? You, uh, money's no problem, but I'm still gonna walk around like I'm the ooh, I'm a man. No, you're a you're a wolf now. Get down there, come on. 
I want to see what happens when you throw him in the wolf pen and they all look at him and sniff him and go, fuck are you doing? He said it took three days from the final fitting to it being delivered to his door and it was the longest three days of his life but it's the most excitement he's ever felt I've, in a long time. I imagine Peter Griffin just yeah, it's really super excited waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting every day for someone that comes along. Is that my wolf suit? Is that my wolf suit? Oh Peter, what is it? Ah, it's just out my wolf costume. <laughs> Diggity goo. Um he said my order to look like a real wolf who can walk on its hind legs was difficult, but they've completed the task and I look it, it looks exactly like I imagined. I must stress I am a wolf, not a werewolf. I'm not a monster. You're not a wolf, though. You're walking around on two legs. You're human in a wolf costume. Get down on those hands. Come on. So the exact cost was £18,700 for the suit, and then there was postage and packaging as well. How much? £18,700. But then he had to pay for it to be shipped to his house as well. How much was that? Let's say, I don't know. It cost let, about nineteen take grand. It, say, take it, I was going to say, take it it's like twenty grand. Yeah. Eh, you know, money. It's money. <laughs> you only alive once. If you got the money, yeah. He says, well. although some people think it's frivolous for me to spend so much money on this, there's no denying how realistic, how lifelike this looks. Right, Dan. Me and you, right now, we both got wolf costumes. We can both go hang out together and stuff. First thing I'm gonna do is be like, let's let's rent out like a Ferrari. I'll come pick you up, and we just drive around as wolves in Ferraris. Amazing. And just do things. I'd go skating. Yeah. Fucking, I'd go DJing. Be like fucking DJ Wolf over there. Like, I'd, I'd be, be rapping. The shit ever. I'd, I'd rap while you DJ. Fucking out the Wolf Brothers. <laughs> That's it. The Wolf Brothers. That's who we are. I DJ and you MC. Oh, that would be awesome, be wouldn't amazing. it? Amazing. I'm really up for that. Yeah, well, if you've got <laughs> 40,000 pounds, we can get a couple of costumes. Fucking hell, we could, we'll make the money back. Um, we pro he pro said... We probably could make that money back with advertising. <laughs> he said, since I was a small child, I've always wanted to be a wolf. Um, he keeps his followers updated on on YouTube with his antics, but he keeps his face hidden. So he only ever appears in costume. That's because he knows what everyone's going to say. The only name he goes by is Toko. T-O-C-O. -O. He's Japanese, Gav. All right. He says, I rarely tell my friends about my wolf costume. Yeah, my... what happens? <laughs> because I'm afraid they will think I'm weird. Yeah. Yeah. My friends and family would be very surprised to learn that I can become a wolf. Also, you can't become a wolf, can you? No, mate? no, no. Also surprised to learn how much you spent on it. £20,000. Um, yeah, basically, it's got a special slit in it, which is hidden, so you can breathe through it. And you don't... You look, I think you look out of the mouth or something. The way they've done it is... Basically, they, they, it's probably the same sort of stuff they work work into like movies do you know what I mean oh yeah of course um, so the eyes don't move then uh, I don't think so but they look so realistic in these pictures mm. now these pictures guys and I, I have posted this up on the Facebook page but I will do again these pictures look like a six foot wolf walking through the park on its hind legs <laughs> it is just insane it looks so realistic <laughs> fucking what a cunt <laughs> but it's just some <laughs> Japanese guy in there. Toko, the Japanese wolf. Sorry if you're listening. Just come on. What are you doing? Uh, you know, if you're doing it, get on those hands. Come on, four legs. There's no... Not, that's where the story ends. So there's no talk of whether he likes to have sex in the costume. Because that, that is a thing, isn't it? Furries, that's the whole thing. Um, but I think this is not sexual. This is just he's fulfilling himself as a lifelong ambition of becoming a wolf. Yeah, I don't think he's jizzing in the suit. I think he's just... Happy. Just being a wolf. Yeah. Being a wolf. Honestly, do whatever you want. Makes you happy in life. Fucking, you got the money. Crack on. Yep. Gives me and Dan a giggle. What animal costume... If I had £20,000 spare, Gavin, I was going to buy you an animal costume, what animal would you like to become? Elephant. An elephant costume. So, I'll, so I guess I'll just control the head. 
So this would be the opposite. So rather than a giant wolf, this would be a little elephant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it could be a little elephant. I thought about a big one, but that wouldn't work. No. Not control the head, no. So I'm just a little baby elephant. But, I'm, just... but I can't... I can't be that person that says to someone you got to be that and I don't be that myself so that means I'm a baby elephant with my with four legs but, oh, but yeah, also I've got a big bloody uh, hooter yeah yeah that'd be a sight wouldn't it I'm going to fall over but they, baby elephants fall over so they'd think I'm right at home only if I go and get one of a, like a parent elephant all of a sudden just going walking by one day I don't know what it would be looks over sees me there just falling over on my back going oh help me Dan get me out you bastard <laughs> and you're standing again ah they come over squash you thinking you're taking the piss out of this baby elephant think oh it's a little fucking orphaned one I'm having that I have to go with it and then I live the rest of my life as a fucking baby and they're like why isn't it growing why are we three years into this and it's still like that size and I can't Why? explain it because I'm a fucking human. It's just all gone to shit now. But what happens if you hit your head and then you actually then think you are an elephant? I don't think that's going to happen. But I think if we're going to try this out, we've got to be in enclosed areas so no elephants are walking by to try and keep them at me. I don't think elephants are walking by. <laughs> where do you live? <laughs> elephants aren't walking down the street where you live, are they? Let's be honest. <laughs> horses. You don't live in the outskirt villages of Thailand There's where elephants horses just have... going by. But no, no elephants. You're right there. I might be all right. We we'll stick with elephant. You? All right. I don't know. There's too many choices, really. I'm thinking shark. Proper in water, like uh, so, like proper uh, uh, equipment, so you can be underwater. No, no, no? I'm just walk walking down the street. Walking. But a shark. Yeah. <laughs> what, like the two little end, the like the little bit of the fin bit, right at the end, the, that bit. You're really going to walk on that. Yeah, or a crocodile. And then I'd crawl around. I'd be a giant crocodile. Oh, you're so slow. Even me as an elephant walking, I'd be like, come on, let's have a race. I'm beating you. <laughs> I don't want to race. Over, but own. we're not going to race. We're just going to stroll around. What point do you see? A crocodile and a baby. A crocodile and an elephant. A crocodile and a baby elephant hanging out together. <laughs> It's like a, it's like an episode of Peppa Pig, isn't it? It's like a fucking eighties Disney movie with Kurt Russell and voice. And then and then the big bad wolf pops out. Yeah. Like, oh, Toko, you're here! And That's... the evil snake. <laughs> fucking hell! Let's get out of here, Jesus Christ! Well, that was the first story. <laughs> oh shit! I thought that was it. Go right, on then. Uh, How many stories story. you got for us today? Two. Okay, go on then. So, second story. I want to start by talking about a conversation my wife and I had. Is it PG? Um, yeah, it's PG. She said to me about a week or so ago, have you noticed, Dan, dear husband of mine, dear handsome husband she of mine. She don't call you that. She didn't say that. Um, yeah, good she, fuck. That's what she, she said. She said, oi, cunt. <laughs> <laughs> she said uh, to me, I've noticed something. Um, she said she's on TikTok and she's on um, like Twitter and stuff a lot. She said, and, and a lot of people I've been, I follow have been talking about this. Have you noticed that the the attitude in people has changed over the last couple of years? And in fact, we seem to be losing kindness. Kindness seems to be not so present anymore. People seem pissed off and angry and aggressive. And the world just seems like it's got a bit of a negative vibe. And I said, actually, now you say that. So we talked about this. And then I remembered this story, which I'm about to read out, and I wondered if the two were linked. And this kind of touches on that. I've talked about the Mandela effect before and how that is potentially something to do with that experiment they're doing in uh, Switzerland with the uh, Hadron Collider, colliding um, particles and atoms into each other and recreating the black hole therefore they've ripped open a hole to another dimension and they don't know what's in that dimension yet and there's negative energy or dark matter and all that kind of stuff anyway this is a very interesting piece of science that i remember reading a few weeks ago and so i brought this to my wife and said this might be the reason because the earth is changing let me explain this is the headline the earth has an inner core made of iron which spins and because of that, the Earth spins. That's one of the many reasons the Earth spins. And that core has just stopped turning 
and may now be starting to go around the other way, which means at some point in the next uh, 100 or so years, the Earth may start reverse spinning on itself. At what point does that happen? It's all of a sudden just like thing, it's, 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 not gonna be, it's gotta be a gradual thing, but... It's gonna be very, very gradual. It's taken millions of years. But that means it'll have to, to slow down for it to be gradual and smooth transition from one to the other. The Earth would have to really slow to a point where it stops, but that would mean it would take over a massive period of time, which would also mean that a certain part of the planet would have no sunshine and the other part will for a long period of time. Because it would slowly go back and forwards. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But so, the main the main flux of the main bit of this story though is because okay. that's that's all here to say the planet is spinning backwards. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The main thing is is that the Earth's inner core has stopped rotating and potentially is now going to go into reverse. Mm. Even if the Earth continues to spin in the normal direction, because because the core is going in the opposite way to the way the Earth is spinning, mm. this could be having an effect on everything on the planet energy we talked about energy before all that kind of stuff and this could potentially be why everything seems to have gone to shit in the last four or five years and there's a lot of negative energy out there crazy things are happening you know whether it's trump being president or riots or covid and it, it does seem like mankind doesn't really give a fuck about itself at the moment. Uh, we are uh, in a uh, massive worldwide change, which is going to take quite a few years. But we are in the, right in the middle of it. I would say myself, we're in a massive. There's going to be a massive change going on, and and yeah, it, it's getting a lot of people are letting out their angers a lot more, and obviously internet and social network and stuff's been going on for a long time people being negative on it because that's just a fucking platform for a lot of people would be able to just vent like that but yes definitely right uh some weird shit going on it has been for a little a lot more huge amounts all the time the news is always filled every other week with some other fucking crazy thing which you wouldn't expect um and i wonder if it is linked yeah. to because at the end of the day we're all animals on this planet and we're all linked to this planet in some way you know um and i wonder if something to do with something is changing within the the the, the center of the earth and that is why things just feel off and feel different yeah <clears throat> that's 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 my side theory but the main story here is that the earth's inner core has stopped spinning and now may go into reverse there's a lot more to it than that. There's no point in sort of going yeah, on about I, it. Yeah, I would actually love to get into that with, with a, a, a physicist or something. I'd love to really uh, to talk about that more because, um, like I say, uh, half the world's going to be in sunshine, the other half the world's not. The Earth's inner core is the size of Mars. Um, so Mars is quite small. Um, and it's made of iron and nickel. And it's about one-third of the Earth's mass. So... It's it's big enough that it's one third of the Earth. So if that starts spinning the other way, which they can say people are saying it, it might do if it, now it's stopped, that is going to have some effect on the Earth, on potentially on gravity, on the atmosphere. It's pretty weird. Yeah, I'd want to get into that deep with someone. The reason they discovered it was in 2009. They were checking some seismic records and thought. There's been no change in these seismic records for quite a few years. Then they realised that was because the Earth's inner core rotation was slowing down so much that it wasn't causing the same ripples and, you know... So it's just very strange. And this could be why we're getting a lot... You know, I know global warming is part of the reason, but this could be why the weather is acting up and why there's been a lot more earthquakes, volcanoes, tidal waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just want to think about them. We're all strange. Yeah, totally. So I think what we should all do, guys, is go out and buy a wolf costume or a baby elephant costume and just forget about the Earth's dinner core. If you've got a birthday party or bar mitzvah coming up, hire the Wolf Brothers. We'll be there. <laughs> What's our number one song that we do? Howling Wolf Wolf Howl. It's called. Great. Look forward to doing that. Bill. Bill, it's time to take us out of your glory. I mean, to take us out of the world of the strange, please. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of the Strange. Next week, though, 
Give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. The house looks just like the one next to it. And the one next to that. And the one next to that. A young couple live in it. Give Ken a kiss. <laughs> you are so unlucky. With their three children. <laughs> and something more. Do you remember when you woke up and you said you were here? Uh-huh. Well, who did you meet? Who's here? TV people. Something's funny going on here next door. Something, uh... We were wondering if maybe you had experienced any disturbances lately. What kind of disturbances? I don't know what happens over this house. Crosses a frightening new threshold into a world within our own. Its form is revealed. What is it? Its focus is clear. And the games are over. It knows what scares you. A family's home is haunted by a host of demonic ghosts. That's a quick one. That took no time at all to get to that. That's basically what's going on here. They don't need to explain anymore. It's as simple as the font itself, which, but less, my friend, is more, isn't it, Daniel? Indeed. Well, let's hear what Don says about it. Uh, and then we will get into the TV with Car- with Carrie Ann, Carol Ann, not Carrie Ann, Carrie Ann Moss, Carol Ann, whoever. Anyway, Don says <laughs> says Poltergeist is a huge part of my horror history. I'm a few years older than you guys. Yes, the big five zero is upon me. So this movie hit me at a very formative time in my life. Much like Jaws, this film hit me when I was young enough to truly be frightened by it. Yeah, that's. Come on, Don, that's a great age when this came out because obviously, so what, it's 82, I was five, you were what, four? Yeah. So I wasn't really getting it. So he was probably he almost, was probably good, about ten? Yeah, he, he, well, it was, yes, uh, nine, <laughs> yeah, eight, nine, ten. He was getting it at a good age, definitely. Yeah. He said, I've chased that feeling ever since, and the older we get, the harder it is to feel, which is why movies like this carry so much nostalgia. Throw in an amazing cast, a killer story, wonderful effects, some of which don't hold up as well, but some sure do, and a great behind-the-scenes story that adds to the overall lore of the film. To start with, is the movie cursed? Maybe. Who directed it? We all know the debate over that, but I don't care. It has some of the wonderful warmth and detailed feel of the eight of the eighties Spielberg movies, with a, with a true horror and story of a Toby Hooper film, the best of both worlds. From the minute we travel through the house with the family dog meeting every member of the family, mm. I'm all I'm all in. That's classic Spielberg. That is that, is that it does give you a Spielberg fingerprint. That little bit there is classic. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, the classic horror lines they're here. You move the grain stones, the graves, but you didn't move the bodies. Good old Zelda reassuring us a bit too soon that this house is clean. The idea of a poltergeist itself and the difference between that of a regular ghost. All of these things. My biggest fear from this movie, that's that fucking clown doll. My older sister tormented me for years with a similar clown of her own that would, that would appear under my sheets and behind my door whenever I would let my guard down. Oh, that's fucking, me. That's, that's amazing. I fucking love it. 
The closet never felt safe again either after this. Fist bumped your sister there. <laughs> also, every creepy tree from that point on made me look twice to make sure it hadn't moved. This is how I learned to count the thunder before the lightning to see how close the storm really was. Same here, actually. Uh, yep, yep, yep. And uh, uh, I've taught uh, my kids that as well. I definitely never wanted a swimming pool in my backyard after this movie. <laughs> I could go on... Uh, I could go on from Murray Hamilton as dad's boss to thinking how fun it looks to smoke weed in bed with my super cool wife. Okay, I'll save some stuff for you guys to talk about now, but this movie has it all in my book. Does it still hold up? I don't know, but to me it always will. And I hope they never try a ridiculous remake. Oh, yes, they did. Yikes. So, I'm super oh, yeah. excited... So I'm super excited for you that you've chosen my movies, yep. and I can't wait. Well, you chose them, Don. I just said, yeah, we haven't covered them. That's fine. Um, and he says, I can't wait to hear what you've got to say about them. Thanks, gentlemen, and keep it up. Your buddy across the pond in good old Belmar, New Jersey, Donnie Darko, <laughs> a.k.a. Don C, signing off. Amazing. Great, great, great email. So good. Thank you for giving us your backstory on that. I love the fact that your sister did that. I think that's fucking <laughs> rad as hell. That's the sort of thing I would do. Um, if I'd had siblings. Well, you've got a sister, haven't you? Danielle Harris, as we've <laughs> discussed. Danielle. I was drunk that time. Um, Gav, mm. you tell me about your, um, uh, you know, history with this film. and um, <clears throat> My history for this would have been... Um, I don't remember initially... the. F I would have seen the, the this one previous to this but i was a lot younger i think and not really paid attention i don't know but i remember specifically one christmas like my folks always had parties with loads of people and i've never been up for really socializing too much and stuff like, fucking, i don't want to hang out with my fucking parents friends bollocks or you go down there and be like someone almost your age but they're a dick it's like oh, you know so i would um just stay upstairs and i'd go downstairs and just rummage and get food do you know what i mean and go back yep. upstairs there'd be all these plates of food like all these tables of food and shit and uh, one christmas they're playing my pot was one two and three on bbc two every night and um i recorded them on vhs as well at the same time each night when they're on but all three of them have a massive place in my heart for that especially uh, um three i can't remember that well to be honest with you but one and two specifically, because I find two just as good. Sorry if uh, if this offends anybody. I don't know why it really would, though. I find part two just as good as part one, to be honest with you. I, you know, it probably it hasn't got some... Part one has got, obviously, it is the better film. But I do think part two is very, very good up there. And um, I don't know. All three of these films all went together for me. So, um, but... Yeah, this film stuck for me for a long time. It's just been a really good... You, you kind of forget it's a ghost movie, a haunted house movie. It doesn't come across as a haunted house movie. It's something different, and I think that is the mixture of Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg. Uh, jump into that very, very quickly. I did listen to a podcast with a crew member, um, and he said Toby Hooper was doing a lot of stuff. Um, but Spielberg obviously was whispering in his ear. Absolutely. And to be fair, if I was fucking directing and Spielberg was producing me, I would be saying to him, what would you do here? You know, I'd probably do that and I'd probably get them to go for that. Okay, <laughs> right, do what he said. I, I, do you know what I mean? But um, he may have had a, his head in a bag of cocaine as well. I don't know. That's supposed, <laughs> to, be, that's supposed to be also something which going on. But then again, it's Toby Hooper. Man, he's a hippie. He loved to fucking party. <laughs> He was fucking partying on Polar Guy's set. Fuck yeah. What a gig. You know, what's your yeah. story with this then? Uh, so, again, it was on television in the UK. Um, and it was recorded. And I think, I think I probably watched it nine, ten, maybe. Not, I wasn't super young, but enough of an age. It yeah. really, really scared me. It was one of these ones I went and talked to people in the playground the about. Face melt. That was the thing on the playground. Everyone talked about the face melt in the uh, uh, the mirror. Yeah, and I think I think my parents didn't mind me watching it because they. I don't think they paid much attention to it, and they just assumed, because it felt like a Spielberg movie, they just assumed it was another E.T., you know, another Close Encounters, I another Goonies. what I watched. I'd fucking be watching hardcore porn or anything. The one... I actually was more terrified, eventually, 
of Poltergeist 2, especially the scene where he drinks the tequila worm. Um, that yeah. scene really fucked me up for some reason. So in, I still... my, in my head, I feel like that is in the first one, but no, it's in the second one. Um, but the first one, that was my first watch of it, but I must have seen this about 20 times, and it only gets better with each watch, and I only appreciate it more as an older person now, now with kids this yeah, is my first now, watch now, of it with kids yeah because now you're on the dad's side totally yeah um i always loved it when the dad was and the mum was smoking weed in bed you're like whoa i know it's just got so many layers to it <laughs> and that's what we should so let's get this discussion out of the way we we both know that toby hooper did direct this despite the rumors the reason that people debate this is because spielberg so spielberg was making et down the road and he wasn't allowed to direct two films at once, or, or I think he was. I think E.T. was finished, and he was wrapping up the like the, the posts. You know, he was doing all the um, editing and the last bits on it. But he wasn't contractually allowed to work on another film as a director. So instead of him directing this, he got his buddy Toby in. Toby directed it. Where did that... they become buddies? I, I was trying to think of this. When did the Spielberg go? I know the guy that this would be good for filming. Uh, well, this was this was um, late seventies, early eighties Hollywood, and as I mentioned in the intro, I that, they all Holly- each other, but... that Hollywood oral history does touch on how everybody just knew each other. But it's just um, strange. I, but I, I do. I've got to admit, I am quite a fan of Salem's Lot. Oh, Salem's Lot is incredible. And that's Toby Hooper. Yeah. Um, but I think so. This for me, the, the reason why I think a lot of people would agree. The reason why people find it hard to see this as a Topi Hooper film is because it, it's it's a Spielberg family, a Spielberg neighbourhood, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a but, f- the field of it, yeah. But, so when the family are together, it feels Spielberg. But when the horror and the terror hit, it feels Toby Hooper. And, and there are, there's definitely been confirmed that Spielberg directed some scenes so he would have stepped in, probably directed, I don't know, just silly scenes with the family mucking around or something like that. Because you can feel that, for sure. Uh, and you would almost feel like this film could take place in the same neighbourhood as E.T., The Goonies, Close Encounters. It all could take place in the same universe, even, like a multiverse. But the film even has two openings, to, doesn't it? It's got one opening which feels very Toby Hooper scary... And then it cuts to the dog, like we, like Don said, going around the house, and suddenly you're in the Spielberg opening to the movie. So even the start of the film is like, this film's going to take you on a bit of a a mishmash of journeys. But ultimately, it's going to be a really sweet and lovely family who are going to get fucked up by this spirit. Okay, so what we got here, when you have this debate come up, basically when you come down to it, you've got a screenplay by Spielberg. He is credited screenplay, okay, with two other guys. It's also produced by Kathleen Kennedy and Frank mm. Marshall, who would go on. So so I'm going to say me, for example, just throwing it out there. Um, if they produced, and I directed a film, and they produced it, they had their crews, yeah? Spielberg writes it. We've also got Jerry Goldsmith, who scored a few of Spielberg's films, yeah, doing that as well. If you'd have thrown that all over something, but I directed it, you're still going to go, oh, it really feels like a Spielberg film. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because The Goonies felt like a Spielberg film and it wasn't. Arachnophobia felt like a Spielberg film and it wasn't. He dire- he produced those. It's because you've got, and you've got Catherine Kennedy and Frank Marshall. That's what it comes down to. It's that whole, you've got basically, you're going into someone's house that's just already there and they they make their movies and they make the movies well. And you're jumping in with a story and you're going to direct it in there and they're like, yeah, no worries, you can use our you, our crew, all our people, um, and uh, we'll we're, we're write it and we'll produce it and we'll oversee you directing it on set every day, And uh, but you direct it. It's going to be like a Spielberg film. Yeah, that's where I'm coming at it, I think, you know? So I think that kind of is the the discussion as much as we need to have really around the director. Let's briefly touch on the curse, <clears throat> but we've again we've covered this and 
you do on your show as well. I was going to say, yeah, a little plug from my other show that I do again. Shout out to RJ. Um, I do another show called Blame It on the Aliens podcast, and we, we cover sort of conspiracy theories and silly things that could or couldn't be real, urban legends, that kind of thing. Um, for episode seven, um, which we did for Halloween Just Gone, we did Cursed Movies, and we particularly looked at The Omen and the poltergeist so if you want to hear more about it go and listen to my show if you want to my other show if you want to but briefly for anyone that doesn't know um people believe and it's been confirmed that they used real skeletons at the end of the movie and because of that people believe that the movie is cursed because uh, the actress that played uh carol ann died not long after making poltergeist three um and that's it's such a sad thing, really, as well. Yeah, of a very rare stomach. She's so cute in Paul Goss as well. She is. Well, Drew Barrymore and her were both up for the role, and in the end, uh, Spielberg Drew was like... Yeah. yeah. Um, and Joe Beth Williams, um, not Joe Beth Williams, sorry, Dominic Dunn, who plays the, do- the other daughter, Dana, she was murdered by her boyfriend before this movie had its screening. Well, the soundtrack played in the background. Yeah, so that happened. And then um, Tangina died, uh, Zelda Rubinstein, the guy that went on to play the creepy old man um, in 2 and 3, he got cancer and died, and they used his face as a mask in the third one. Oh, my God. um, Like, they basically made a mould of his face. I've seen that third one ages. I've got it on VHS. Um, and there's lots of stuff on the set that weird stuff that happened uh, the set burnt down one of the sets burnt down or got struck by lightning all the similar stuff you would have heard with the omen so there's a lot of stuff to say this is one of those cursed films and actually bad news is there's no such thing as bad press they say and this has only made this film even more you know oh you've got to see this film because you know, everybody in it died Jay, you know that kind Jay of... enjoyed it uh, one afternoon I watched it with Jay and uh, yeah, they really annoyed it actually. It's an afternoon movie worked very well, you know, it's a horror movie. And something that and something that Spielberg does well and, and only in the writing and obviously I know he didn't direct it, is he gives you a real family with real conversations, real dinner table scenes, that kind of thing. And then he puts us like same with Jules, you know, that family just feels so cute and nice. And then you throw a shark into the mix. And yeah. it's the same with this. You throw a poltergeist into the mix. Close encounters. You just throw a bunch of UFOs into the mix. Going back to the uh, the weirdness of it, I've got poltergeist on big box VHS tape, right? Poltergeist 1. I've also got another copy of poltergeist 1 big box VHS tape. Both exactly the same, right? But one of them, on the reel itself, is poltergeist 2. It's really weird. It's really weird. God is in his holy temple. I don't know why that is. It doesn't make any sense. Because when they pressed that, why? So did someone just have a copy of the first one, pirate over the copy themselves? Because it's a legit copy on it when it comes on. So it's really weird. Oh, the other thing that happened is when they were filming the clown scene with the, the boy, you need dogs. Robbie, the clown mechanism just went, wouldn't turn off and it was strangling him and he passed out. Mm-hmm. So, thought, yeah, oh, that kid's got some acting <coughs> skills. No, he's dying. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, that kid's a great actor. Keep rolling. Get me another bag of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's get into this film. This okay. movie. Okay. So we start off with the Toby Hooper opening, which is the, font. the American anthem playing back at, back in the day. To our, our younger listeners, um, I love us, it. Yeah, us we had older it as well. People, we will you remember the times when the TV would just stop showing t- programs at like one, one in the morning or the something. Not sign off. So good night good. from everybody at the BBC. Yeah, it's like good, literally good like now. Everyone's asleep. None of you would be up now, so we're going to turn off the television. Good night. So we we get that. We get the pixels at the end of the TV lingering around, and this is a little sign of the things to come because the TV's going to play a big part, as anybody who's even seen the poster for Poltergeist will know. Mm-hmm. And Dad's asleep. Um, 
in the chair and then we cut to the what i like to call the spielberg opening then which is when the dog's awake and he goes around and as don says it's a very clever way of introducing us to this family we've got a mum we've got a dad we've got a younger sister an older sister and we've got a, a middle son john um, Carpenter did it in the thing with the uh the wolf that comes into the uh not the wolf the fucking you know Husky. Husky. I was going to say snow dog. Husky comes into the uh, uh, the pack camp, camp, goes wandering around, shows us a geography of the uh, layout of the uh, where they are. And we are thrown straight into some weirdness because um, Carol, Carol Ann wakes up and she says hello to the TV. Hello. Oh, so good. And she just starts saying, what? I can't hear you. What it, do you mean? She has this lovely cute little conversation her little barn nose is talking away and she's all cute and shit she's so cute isn't she yeah. um and the family wakes up because she's there sort of sh- and eventually she's shouting at the tv it's like me and you fuck off <laughs> <laughs> and then we get a lovely sort of uh credits over a really uh, Spielberg sort of scene and, and you know it's a very Spielberg neighbourhood yeah, um, great score yeah really good score beautiful the men so this this movie is is real Amer- like we're not American obviously guys listening but to me this this always really represented America because you've got the men watching football and they're all drinking beer going hey, come on all right. Just before this, there's a, <clears throat> you're giving that wide opening shot of the layout of the place, and it's so like the burbs, you know. And you got this like you're straight away like, who's this fucking guy coming down the road on a BMX, just oh, falling yeah. all over the place, pissed so out of his face? He's got a crate of beer, crate of t- cans of beer, and it's a crazy sweaty dude. And then these kids have got little radio control cars, so they start trying to knock him off his bike and he didn't he just starts dropping beers he don't care though cause he's, he's more over the floor he's turned up for the party for the football party hey guys hey guys don't worry what's, what's the score come on what's going on yeah america whoa 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 they're really loving it um, um i <clears throat> i love this though him and his neighbor have the same tv so they have the same tv remote control so the sensor is that that like it must be like an aerial you click it and then it changes the channel so that means each person is changing the channel for their tvs it's a really funny scene and there's lots of little silly bits like this which all add yeah, to yeah. this it gives it a nice playfulness you take <clears throat> you're taking the audience to like um a real nice like like nothing like to like hereditary totally the opposite do you know what i'm saying hereditary you're straight away you're like we're in a horrible place we're in a horrible place <laughs> you know yeah this this is like oh this is like a real nice little place i quite like this i like i like what's going on here it's a nice little family dynamic and it's similar to a film that we you and i both would say is in our top probably three maybe the burbs where <laughs> You know, everybody knows everybody, you know, and it's there's these silly, yeah. these silly little things with the remote control, like in this, but like in the burbs, you've got like the guy who's dog shits on the other guy's lawn and all this kind of stuff, you know, and it's all tedious stuff that we've all experienced with neighbours. Obviously, TVs are much more advanced now. You wouldn't get this happening, but what's the matter? Gav thought he heard a noise then. No, that's some weird music. Oh God! You're freaking me out. Well, it's a very funny really scene. Music I can hear. It must be funny. very funny scene that, with the remote control because every time the guy changes the channel, my kids want to watch. I just told you that. Smurfs that. or whatever it is. No, yeah. no, it's um, uh, Mr. Rogers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful but, day in the neighbourhood. Yeah, we've done. That. But yeah, hilarious. Very funny scene, and it goes on a little bit. So we get we get a bit of backstory there, and then we upstairs. Mum's tidying the kids' room. And the budgie's dead. Yeah. Oh, Tweedy. Couldn't you have waited till a school day? Because they're obviously just going to buy another budgie the same colour and just say, yeah, Tweety's still going. Um, so, yeah, bird's dead. And she, I love the moment, though, where she's dangling it over the toilet. She's just about to drop it in to flush it away. And Caroline walks in, sees her mum. 
Shut the door. <laughs> if you're doing that shit, shut the door. Come on. It's about to flush a bloody budgie you away. You won't flush a budgie down a toilet, because if it doesn't go down, you've then got to try and pull out a soggy dead budgie I, from your yeah, but Hang on, Gav, I've done turds bigger than that budgie. Come on. <laughs> if those can flush down in one, then so can that budgie. I hope you never get to the point ever in your life you've got one of your turds and a dead budgie in front of you and you're actually comparing sizes. I hope that never happens, my friend. Or That's you're a shitting, weird day for you. Or you're shitting out a dead budgie. It's just going into strange territory. I don't want to know. It's almost going into Cronenberg body horror shit. I don't like this conversation and where it's leading to. So cut to Robbie, the son, and he's climbing up a tree and he's really loving climbing up this tree. He feels safe. He likes the tree. That's going to change at night time. Yeah. So they get they get Tweety by uh, a little funeral, gets buried. Again, very, very cute. This is if he's hungry. This is if he's scared. This is if he's lonely. And she puts all these bits in the shoebox with him. They bury him in the garden. The food's buried, though. It's such a kid thing. Can I have a goldfish now? Cut to her feeding the goldfish. I was like, oh, my God. Also, the second that they put the last bit of soil down on top the dog's like <laughs> they're digging it up straight away yeah, it, like it, that dog's gonna eat that thing that within is, minutes yeah yeah it's gonna dig it out and eat it. So well, yeah like, she's got she's got a goldfish now uh i watched this on my blu-ray copy and goddamn at this point here we've got this thunderstorm coming in this looks so beautiful on my tv i just sent you that shot of that little bit and it just looks yeah. so nice yeah and so yeah gav the thunderstorm starts rolling in and it's night time and the the kids have left the curtains open and Robbie's looking at the tree thinking, OK, I think I'm actually a bit scared of this tree now. The weird lighting on it, it could be a face, it could be arms, I'm not sure, but it's just a tree, but it looks fucking scary. It's just the shape of it. Um, and then, of course, Carol Ann's afraid of the closet. Mama, Mama, the closet, put the night, put the light on in the closet. So she does. Night, night, kids, go to sleep now. There's no trees coming to get you and there's nothing in the closet. It's all fine. And then on my next line says, uh, Mum and Dad are getting blazed. I know, it's amazing. You don't see this in your average family. Because let's, let's re remind everybody as well. This movie, was, this movie was a PG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In the UK. Yeah. I believe it was a, um, a PG-13. Did, did, did they not... No, because especially then, we're in the, going into like the height of um, the BBFC cutting down on video nasties. Oh, but, but instead... They're, they're so posted video nasties. Let's just put a PG rating on this film where a man rips his own face off. It's very scary scenes. And the parents are getting stoned in the bedroom. Why not? I'm going to go with the power of Steven Spielberg, my friend. That's what. Yeah. Well, they're getting blazed, and they're worried about Carol Ann sleepwalking, because apparently she sleepwalks, and they're having a pool built in the back garden, and, and Mum's worried that she'll go sleepwalking and slip into the pool one night. I've got that Darth Vader head Rob, Robbie has in his, in his bedroom. Still You've got, got it? it. I've still, still got, got it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah Robbie's bedroom, essentially Robbie's bedroom is what my bedroom is like in, in that type of time. It's very interesting the way they do this. Now, in that bedroom... They shoot it super close. At no point do they show a wide shot of both beds. So that gives the impression that they're both in different bedrooms. Okay. Right at the beginning of the whole time, it was almost bugging me. And I was like, this is a choice. Until later on, when the shit starts to hit the fan, they show then a wide. It's the first time they show a wide of both beds in that one room. Because I was like, Carol Ann has an alien poster. And that's in my notes, and it really confused me. So then, getting to that first wide shot later on when the shit hit the fan and things are flying around the room, you're like, oh, they didn't show that at first. Why was that? It's, it's a strange choice. I don't know why. But um, it's definitely a choice. Robbie is scared of his clown toy, so he covers it up. And this will come back later on, as we all know. Uh, but because of that, he goes into his parents' room, mm. which kind of sort of wrecks their high a little bit because they're sort of in the middle of having a laugh. Dad's doing press-ups. and I love the fact, just silly little things like, oh, I can't roll this one. You roll it. And he throws her the box and he throws her the weed and mum starts rolling because mum's the better roller out of the two of them. And it's just such a like lovely little moment between them where they're sort of relaxing after a hard day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the fact he can't roll a joint. Just fucking throws it everywhere. It's brilliant. 
Um, so he takes Robbie back in the room and he says to the kids, look, this is how you can tell if a thunder, how far away a thunderstorm is. Here confused me as well. So I'm going to lie. If what I just said then, there's one shot here of another bed. And you see the when he's taking Robbie and telling him about the thing, the thunderstorm counting, he, you can see another bed in the background, but Caroline's not in it. So it's really weird. It's, it confused me. So I was like, are they sharing a bedroom and there's a third bed in that room? I was really confused by the whole thing because then it cuts to her and she's in bed. And I was like, what the fuck's going on here? It was The editing of it was fucking me fucking with my head for the first time oh. ever because I was really looking at the film. It's weird. Well, there's an editing shot that I can't wait to talk about with you in a moment. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, say so this is where everybody who watched this movie at a young age learned to count thunder and i've told my children and hopefully they will tell theirs yeah you say one mississippi or you say one cats and dogs two cats and dogs my my parents oh, uh, to, count. I just to count. all right you've got to fill it with something so it's either one mississippi or one cats and dogs whatever it is but yeah uh yeah, and, and they realize the thunderstorm's going away so don't be scared that's all fine uh the tv static <clears throat> is playing in the, the bedroom caroline wakes up and we get our first real glimpse at something supernatural here because this really cool looking ghost hand flies out of the TV like something you'd see in Ghostbusters and sort of touches her and then goes back in and she's a bit like, whoa, what was that? And then she hears whispers, whispering to her and she doesn't quite know what that is. Uh, and then the whole bedroom starts shaking. Well, the music score is very much Ghostbusters here. Yeah, I suppose it is. Really Ghostbusters like. Yeah. Well, the whole room shakes like an earthquake, and everyone wakes up because a few things fall off the shelves. And she turns around and says the classic line, Gav. They're here. That was the big line back in the day, and still a classic line now. Um, so it's the morning, and the pool is being dug up. Um, they're having a family breakfast. Uh, who were you talking to when you said they're here, Caroline? Oh, the TV people. What? Yeah, yeah they're, they're just talking to the TV people. It's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. Um, the builder, the daughter leaves for school. And the builders are like, I love a piece of that. Look at that. Woo-wee. She's about 16. Leave her alone, you dirty old <laughs> bastards. It's funny, but did you know it's one of the uh, builders? No. Oh, come on, Daniel. Who is it? It's um, if, uh, Thingy from Predator. Um, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger? It's Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's, um, what's he called? Billy. Billy! Oh, come on, got Billy! Spooked. It's Billy. He's one of the builders. Oh, wow. I did not know that. And she flips him off. Uh, yeah, he's just, he's just there. I was watching it with Sarah last summer which, which randomly is like I switched podcast yeah fuck it and I was like oh my god check out it's Billy from fucking Predator yeah because she flips him off and mum's watching this whole thing at the window and she's, she's like she's, ha, ha, ha. And I was my, like, oh, my daughter what? proud it, of her it's the 80s um, the dog is barking at the spot on the wall really? that the uh, sort of ghost hand touched above the parents bed that's good I, I love good dog actors and it brings a ball to the bed, doesn't it? And puts it on the bed like it wants to play with something that's on the wall. Yeah. Now make we get... It's, make it, it's what it is, though, is you're taking... Uh, it's brilliant, really, when it comes down. If you really think about how brilliant it is, everybody loves a dog. Everybody trusts a dog, and everybody trusts a dog's judgment. So you're straight away... This is making this like a, a real fun... fun sort of thing here. It's making it harmless. It's not too bad. Do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, because if the dog wants the to dog play wants with it. Play and it's pretty ball. Well, it can't be a bad thing. So now we get... Full sense of security. One of my favourite scenes in the film, if not my favourite scene in the film, um, the chair scene. Um, so Mum asks about the TV people. Yeah, again. This is great. She seems very open to it. They're, again, they're sort of hippies a bit, so she's probably quite open to these kind of things. And... Um, she wants to know more about it. And meanwhile, Dad's off doing his job. Dad shows houses to people. And, and just before this, we also got uh, just to come into the kitchen and there's a construction worker literally 
Oh, a leaning in the window, <laughs> going in your pot, of, which is on the stove, and having a little spoon of it and eating it. It's like, what the fuck? Get the and then shit. he drinks some coffee. She's like, Get how's the, the coffee? Yeah. And he's like, it's really good. It's really good, Mrs. She Freeling. pushes him out, shuts the window. God damn. Yeah, these are things you wouldn't expect to see in a... You don't see a, that in, 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 in 2020 F3, do you? It's the guy leaning in the window. You just don't need coffee. health and safety. You'd be like, oh, no, no, we can't do that. So, <clears throat> Mum talks about the, um, the the TV people, and while she's doing that, she's tidying up the kitchen, mm-hmm. and then she looks around, and the kitchen chairs around the table are all spread out, and she's like, was that you, Carolantis? Wasn't me. Uh, but she's up for fuck's sake, she's a bit pissed off, which, you know, having kids... Yeah, yeah, you wander around the house tidying up after them. So to to turn around them do it again, it's a bit like fuck's sake, guys, you know. So she turns around, and we get this amazing in-camera trick where they already had the chairs glued together and assembled. And as we pan round with Mum, and she's getting something out of the cupboard, she turns back around, and the chairs are stacked in an almost impossible That's way on the table. It? Yeah. it makes me, it made me jump so much the first couple of times I saw this. And she just looks at Caroline and says, the TV people? And she says, yep. Yeah. And again, like the dog being wanting to play for with it, and her just being so nonchalant almost. Oh, TV people, yeah, yeah, okay. So what? What? I'd be like, the shit. Look at that. Put it quick. Put it on Facebook. That's what I'd do. So Dad's off trying to sell a similar house to theirs because he's basically one of the heads of the company. Um, that's why they've got this amazing new house that they've moved into, and he's selling a, a similar one. Um, when he gets home. Mum's very excited. A bit like in uh, Hereditary, Mum's very excited when Dad gets home, but oh, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, why are the ghosts, are the ghosts just having a laugh? Because if the ghosts are going to be evil and want to kill them eventually, if that's the aim of the mission for the ghosts, why don't you just get on with it? They're just having a little bit of fun of them, trying to get them scared. Do they get scare points? Well, they're poltergeists, aren't they? Which means mischievous spirit. So they, that mischievousness can be hiding your keys, moving your chairs around, or stealing your daughter. Ghost with Dan. <laughs> so Mum shows off the trick to Dad and says, watch this. And the chair, when placed on a certain point, moves down to the other end of the kitchen. They then put a crash helmet. But, but, but no, it's, it's, when she, he comes in and she's like, come on, come check this. It's like literally the um, thingamajiggy, what Tony Collette doing, wanted to do a seance, basically. It's the same sort of thing, the excitement. Come on, come on. And he's just like, oh, God, what is it? Like, Hang on. I, about the time you get in the room and everyone's like, come on, come on. Like, no, just wait, chill out, hang on. She's like, don't step on that bit. Don't step in the circle. Wait, wait, wait. Like, what like, are you talking about? And then the chair just starts to... Rock back and forwards, and he's like, "What the shit?" And then he just slides, and it's just like, "That's so cool." How did they do the slide, Dan? I don't know. I think. Oh, I think with Carol Ann, she was on wires, and they waxed the floor. Okay. Um, but yeah, they put Carol Ann in a little American football helmet, and she flies down to the end of the room as well. And she says to him, "You've got to try it." And she describes what it feels like. She says it feels like all your insides are being pulled, but it feels good and it's like nothing you've ever felt before and there's no air but you can breathe and she describes it like basically so these spirits are touching her and pushing her to the end of the kitchen my, my best bit is when she comes in before it all happens she says to him just okay just have an open mind you remember when you used to have an open mind <laughs> it's so funny like he's it, it, just kind of because we just had a shot of a moment ago of him trying to flog a house which is exactly the same as his house and he's just like, uh, oh, that's what he does, basically. Because that's another thing with this Poltergeist movie. I still do it now. I did it even earlier. Every time I walk by a massive construction site where his house is being built, I think of Poltergeist. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It's like Final Destination when you see the lorry carrying all the big big stakes and shit. You think of Final Destination. <clears throat> now, we get something which we need to discuss, which is a really weird edit jump um, where... They're sort of talking about this whole weird 
you know, well, we can't tell anybody about this. Okay, you make, and then it just cuts halfway through a sentence to the next scene. Is this? Uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. Is this to the neighbour when they go see na- their neighbour? Yeah, well, let, uh, wait, 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 let, let's go back. So let's talk about why that is because this is an interesting bit of trivia. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I did know. Something. Because you would never know, you would never see a, a Spielberg or a Toby Hooper movie or a movie of this caliber with a terrible cut halfway through a sentence that. And then it cuts into another conversation that's already happening. But the reason for that is, all the way through, they're talking about, can we get Pizza Hut? Yeah, we'll get Pizza Hut. Yeah, okay, that's great. We'll get Pizza Hut. Oh, I remember now. Yeah. So the reason that they had to cut where they did was because Pizza Hut saw an early screen of the film. And the dad's original line was, I hate Pizza Hut. So just because of that, they had to cut mid-sentence, and that, and just because Pizza Hut said you can use us in it, but you're not saying that line. Well, um, so, uh, uh, well, yeah, you don't want <laughs> as a sponsor, you don't want them to say I hate that sponsor thing. But why didn't they go back and reshoot that, or edit it better, or cut a little bit earlier? Because, it's just such a weird choice. No, because this has been in post. Probably this happened. Obviously, otherwise they would have shot it again. It's probably too hard just to go and fucking reshoot that bit. It's just like fucking cut it. But you're right. They do go to the neighbours to find out if they've heard about any strange disturbances. It's not hardly, though. They just sit there <clears throat> giggling like children. Well, what do you think they've been doing before they went round there, Gav? Oh, yeah. I don't I think it's not because it's they smoked, then. No, yeah, it's because they smoked. They're, they're so high because they're c- c- cracking up. They can't get the words out. Yeah, they want to ask the, yeah. They want to ask their neighbours if they've felt any weird disturbances, chairs moving around or earthquakes. There should have been possibly just a shot of them discussing it, smoking a joint outside or something. Yeah, but it's pretty obvious they're stoned. I guess. Um, there's like a mosquito buzzing around. And it's, it's a pretty all... good chance that afterwards he did say, I need a joint. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so they now it's just... It's a hilarious like... scene, though. Yeah, because the neighbour's like... And he's got his son there, and he's just standing there just going, yeah, because they don't really get along with him. And he's like, yeah, what do you want? You know, sort of thing. You ever got bit by, by these things, son? No, Dad, don't bite me. No, don't bite me either. And they're just like, these things are just biting those guys over and over. It's just, it's a weird scene, and I really love it. It's just a really weird scene, and he's just like, what the fuck? And they just, they finally get it out at the end. They just say, I was just, just wondering if, if you've, uh, if, if you've had anything to move they don't we don't get an answer just cards which is a good way to play it really yeah so we get back to their house and another storm is coming in and this one seems to be getting closer and robbie's counting and then it's getting closer and he's getting scared scary and then all tree. of a sudden scary tree comes through the window jesus scary Christ. tree it smashes through the window it grabs robbie um the closet door opens. It's like a crazed nightmare here. This is like, at this point here, like, this is American Ralph and London Territory. This can't be going on. Trees. The, the, the poor guy says, the house goes, what? You know, you've, this is how it looks like. You feel like you, this can't be in the movie. A tree's grabbing him. Do you know what I mean? It must and be a, a tro- dream. But it's real. And, it's and, the, and, on, and on top of all of this, there's a tornado outside. In which they kind of put it down to, I guess, because the tree just fucking goes flying off in the tornado. But it's just like, how did this tree do that, though? The tornado wasn't even <clears> here. <throat> well, while they're outside trying to get Robbie out of this tree, which seems to be eating him, swallowing him down, Yeah. Um, Carol Ann and everything else in the bedroom it's gets a, it's a into the closet. Robbie's a misdirect to get them all out so they can get her. That's what they're doing. Well, they managed to get him out of the tree just as the tree flies off away into the tornado. Um, Carol Ann is gone when they get back in. Oh, she must be around here somewhere. Let's search the house. She's not here. Where is she? Carol Ann? Carol Ann? Carol Ann? Oh, my God, she's in the pool. The pool's filled up with rainwater. So, dives in the pool, doesn't he? Yeah. Searching around. Can't find her anywhere. They don't know where she is. She's going to go back in and check the house. Then suddenly, Robbie... Well, they think she's in a swimming pool. Yeah. They've got so I said he dives in the pool. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so he dives in, he's searching around, he can't find her. But then Robbie hears her in the TV. Yeah, it, it kind of freaks him out a bit, really. So, Mum, Mum, she's in here. Well, he can't almost say Mum at first. Mum, 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 Mum. 
it just goes more and more and more and more and more and it's just a bit like whoa that's a lot this kid's not looking in not having a good time with this so mum comes in and she hears caroline but she assumes she's just hiding somewhere in the bedroom she's going i i know you're in here somewhere where are you where are you and then they realize she's in the tv and i put here robbie's scared acting is amazing at this point yeah Cut to Dad visiting the Ghostbusters. Next day they've gone to see the Ghostbusters. It's literally... That's my note. I, this could be... I, oh, yes, this is what I'm about to say to you. You could imagine them sitting there and Dan Aykroyd doing the questions with them. And so, sitting in the middle. Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is just... No, it'd be Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, wouldn't it? Yeah, and Bill's just at the side. But Dan would be doing the most of the questions. Dan would be going, so you've experience strange noises and you're hearing your daughter's voice coming from the television. Do you know Howard... he's autistic? I do, yeah. Mm. And Howard Ramis would just be there going, interesting, did your parents own a slinky? I, I just imagine them talking to him and being like, yeah, we can come and investigate. I just want to see that movie, Poltergeist Ghostbusters. Because this is like the blueprint for for all the paranormal investigators in like things like paranormal um uh, activity and all this that. even the conjuring had do you a, think we yeah. get to that techn- i know we kind of can do all these holograms we get technology where we could just at home ourselves just make our own mashup movies yeah we talked about this in the last episode but ai you can probably do this i want to do it but if someone could edit together just dan Aykroyd and howard ramis interviewing diane freeling and steve freeling about their daughter who's in the television because this is if the Ghostbusters was a TV series, and this would be an episode where they would be like, we've got to go and get this girl out of the TV. Do you know what I mean? This is like definitely a Ghostbusters... It could oh, be a yeah, Ghostbusters yeah. I, plot. I, I want to see this movie. Well, basically, it ends. the scene ends with, can you just find our little girl? Who would it be whose face is pulled apart? Would it be Bill Murray? Yeah, he'd get up in the night. Because yeah. Ray, 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 Ray got the blowjob in the last time, so... Oh, okay. So Peter would get his face pulled off. Yeah. And then he'd be really annoyed. He'd be like, Ray, why do you get the blowjob from the ghost and I get my face pulled off? Yeah, yeah. He would be annoyed. He'd be grumpy. He would be very grumpy. Um, So when they... Uh, so Robbie's terrified when we go back to the house. And the dad is now just smoking continuously. Donna is basically staying at her friend's house all the time, the oldest daughter. Dad shows them around the house and he shows them the bedroom and they're like, so... This is where the activity happened, and I once filmed um, a cup. It's hilarious. Um, over the course of about 12 hours, it moved three inches. And you can't see it with the naked eye, but I've got it on time-lapse, and it's really quite something, just to make you aware. So I'm not unfamiliar with things moving, I promise just you. Just open up the door, and the whole contents are rotating, and actually almost Evil Dead style comical, just coming up to them and just making jokes and stuff. And yeah, like the clown's like, <laughs> and just goes flying off again. And then so you've got like a shit. a compass starts playing the record, the vinyl record. Yeah, uh, it's, then they're just blown away by what they can see. They don't know what to say. They're scared, so they sit them down and they say. They talk to the table and they get, the main lady's got a cup and a saucer and she's just shaking it, shaking it. Oh my God, I'm fucking, I can't hold it still. I'm so like, what the fuck? That's a proper ghost. Oh my God. She tells them about um, the, you know, what portal guys saw. And the she explains. moves in front of them while they're just talking. Yeah, and the, the black guy, uh, the, the, the investigator, he's just like, he's so interested in it all. Because then the light flickers, and mum says, oh, there'll be two more in a minute. They, yeah, always travel in, they always travel it in pairs. And the light flickers twice more, and he's like, this is... And he keeps looking under the table, like, I can smell the burning in the air. That's electricity. Can you feel it? And he's really excited about it. And so although they're terrified, it's also like, this is the case they've this, waited for all the, their lives. What's the same with all these ghost hunters and stuff? Don't go running off when you get a fucking ghost. This is what you want. You want the ghost. Um, Mum then shows them how they talk to Caroline through the TV. They use the lamp as a sort of microphone. They give us an info dump on Poltergeist, actually. Yeah, they do. They talk about the, the family. So spirits. We understand exactly what a Poltergeist is. You've got to remember 82. You know, it's not nowadays. So. Yeah, no one knew what a Poltergeist was, I expect, back then. Some would, but <laughs> it wouldn't have been a massive thing, especially not in mainstream. It's like this movie being a 
uh, Spielberg production, like with everybody else involved, it is would have had a big release, I'm sure. So they talk to Carol Ann through the lamp, who's in the TV, and they've realised they can get her on a particular channel. Cause they've been doing this a lot. They, they, you know, they know their house inside and out, and they know how to speak to their daughter. They've tried everything there is. And the setup is: you talk into the lamp, you put the channel on channel three, and at certain points of, of the day, you can speak to her. Mummy, where are you? Um, I'm scared, Mummy. There's a bright light. Shall I go into it? No, don't go into the light, Caroline. Tell her to stay away from the light. Stay away from the light, Caroline. And while they're talking to her, a portal opens in the ceiling in the living room. Yeah. And some objects drop through. Slimy objects. And then we get this really upsetting point. This is the point when I got a bit teary now, I'm a dad, where she says, Mummy, there's someone here. (gasps) Mummy, I'm a bit scared. And she's saying, "Uh, who is that with her? Who's with you? And she says, stay away from him, stay away from him. Run away, tell her to run away. Run away, run away. And then all of a sudden, her spirit sort of rushes through Diane Freeling, the yeah, mum. feels it go through her. Mm. And this was so emotional, this scene. She says, I can smell her. Smell my clothes. Look, you can smell her on me. Um, it's crazy. You know, it's a really it, interesting take on it. Yeah, it's, she's, she, her spirit is in the house. And what's harder, um, as a parent, um, at this point here, this is someone what your child needs help and you can't help. And it's always a hard thing because you're sort of blaming yourself in many ways. This is what upset me is because I, I couldn't you imagine can't do anything. You're stuck and you can't do it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You can only hear them sort of being scared and knowing that there's something evil with them. And you feel bad because they know that they trust you, and if you're not there, well, then that trust is going. You know. Well, while they're all sort of, you know, in awe of what they've just experienced with Caroline travelling through her mum. Suddenly, there's a load of banging coming from upstairs. Yeah, it's 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 not all good. No, and then you hear a growl, a very big growl, and then something blows them all over. And one of the paranormal investigators, who later quits, <laughs> uh, he comes downstairs. Something bit me. <sighs> Took a goddamn bite out of me, and they you expect it all, to be he a little all shit, though, doesn't he? He does. No wonder he quits. Well, you expect it to be a little nip on his, you know, on his side, but it's like a shark bite on yes. his. Yeah, oh, I'm, su- waist. I'm surprised he does stay because he does stay for a bit doesn't he because that's the one that pulls his face off well we get to night time and some of the family are asleep some of them are not and the paranormal investigators are discussing whether the, whether this is real or not the older sister's freaking the fuck out earlier by the way at this point now she's super freaked out yeah totally understandably yeah 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 um and while they're discussing whether or not it's real if it's a sort of a group hypnosis or something, they also discuss the portal and the en- is there an entrance, you know, where are these things coming from, these objects that fell through. I love all this whole, this little, this whisper thing. I loved it so much. I don't know what it is. But... And then trying to stay quiet and then the, the kid wakes up and starts joining the conversation. Then the dad does, but they're all still whispering. I don't know what it is, but it's got that Spielberg magic to it. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. It's a real innocence, even though they're talking about something quite full on. Because they start talking about the portal, and if there's an exit, then there's probably an entrance, and that entrance is how Caroline got into the, whatever dimension she's in. Yep. And <laughs> then Robbie, very cute, Robbie says, maybe if there's a way, you could tie a rope around me, and I could go in, and I could get Caroline. I might be scared, but I'd save her. She's my sister. And it's so cute, and it's, they're it's all the whispering whis- it. Whis- the, honestly, just the choice of saying, like, well, can we just have this whole conversation? Whispers is such a nice choice, and I'm fully stealing that at some point, because it's great. And then mum, mum and the main paranormal investigator ladies, they talk about ghosts, they talk about souls, energy, and again, it's all whispered. And this it's family like AMSR, is... AMSR, though, you know, that whole thing with a relaxing voice. It's like yeah. that with this. Uh, this family is clearly suffering. They're all they're all sleeping in the same living room together because they're all... They don't want to be apart from each other. Just need but Rick they... Baker to come in and start talking. Fucking... Just, oh. Why do you love Rick Baker talking so much? I don't know. I even put it on his Instagram. <laughs> 
What did you write? I don't know. I said Lewis Anchor but then I did say that you got a very good common voice. <laughs> You're like a long lost brother. <laughs> like a long lost brother of Daniel Harris is my long lost sister. Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, uh, the glass, the guy with the glasses decides I'm going to go up and get something to eat. Did they say to him, uh, uh, yeah, help yourself to anything you want. You can, if you want, in the middle of the night, if you want to grab a steak and start cooking it, you can fry one up. No, I don't think it did. And like, that's going to stink the house out at like, what, three in the morning. What does he do? Have you ever cooked a steak at three in the morning? Who does that? No one. But this no, guy does. No vegetables or nothing. It's just literally no, that. Just and look, the worst thing is, he sl- he takes it out of the fridge, slaps it down on the counter, not even on a plate. <laughs> so what are you doing, mate? And I know he's going to fry it, so it doesn't matter. It's going to fry off any germs. But he slaps it down on the side of the... It might as well be there with the eggs from Ghostbusters just bubbling away on their own. I, just... I was so shocked by that. How we, how we just thought, ah, oh, fuck it. He's like um, Art from... Uh, the yeah. verbs, isn't he? Just yeah, helping yeah. himself. Absolutely. Is, is that the same? It, was it something in the eighties? Then is that the same as the, the guy earlier stuck his head in the window and was just uh, drinking coffee? What's going on with them all? <laughs> I don't know. They were just helping themselves to their food. Um, <laughs> so he goes, and while he slaps the steak down in the background, the steak starts sort of crawling along on its own, doesn't it? Yeah. And he looks around and he sees this. It's great. And then it just starts sort of bursting with maggots coming out of it. That's brilliant. This is the Toby Hooper moment, isn't it? This is yeah. your... Yeah, it's lovely. Awful Toby Hooper maggots moment. He's got a real Ghostbuster score again going on. It's great. It's really good. Well, he's very he... scared of well, what he's this. He's also, as, as well, well, though, as... as go on, what shall I eat? I'm just going to go to the kitchen and get a snack. Gets it out a drum, cold chicken drumstick, starts eating away that, then gets a steak. So he's eating some <laughs> chicken and a steak because he's just going to go get a snack. But anyway, yeah, he's, he's full of maggots. This is chicken. It goes into the little side um, sink unit with a mirror above it. Looks in the mirror, got oh, wash some water off his face. Oh my god. That wasn't very good. I didn't like that. It's a bit traumatic, that was. Hope nothing else happens. What happens? Ah, uh, my face, I'm going to pull it off. Spielberg's hands. Oh, oh that really? Was Spiel- yeah, Spielberg's hands. So he was on set for this scene as well. Um, oh, and that was just... his his hands in that. Yeah. I don't know as how this kid, made it into a PG. As a kid, this freaked me. Not freaked me out as a kid, though. It was, it's a very memorable moment. The This is maybe what Don is referring to when he says the effects haven't held up well in areas. And, yeah, OK, it doesn't look no, that great. I watched it on Blu-ray, so no, no, not really. But still, it's cool. It's cool. And, and then he suddenly snaps out of it and it was all hallucination. So the spirits are messing with him. They want him gone. They basically are trying to get rid of these paranormal investigators by scaring them away. So they scare him away because eventually he does he does quit. You cut back um, to the other mate, the other ghostbuster. He should be concentrating on what he's doing. No, he's just got some headphones on, listening to some music, looking away from the camera monitors, drawing pictures. So what, what are you doing? And the cameras must be on these sensors. So all of a sudden they notice something coming down the staircase. And it catches loads and loads of ghosties. Yeah. Well, initially a lady ghost. It's quite... But then when they play it back... And they all notice, they all start waking up and looking. And it's like, wow. And when they when they um, play it back on the monitors, you don't expect anything to be on there because ghosts never get caught on camera. But this actually shows like you said loads of ghosts walking down the stairs and they're sort of who are they what do they want well it's it freaks them out enough that robbie gets sent off to stay with his grandma um dana goes uh, to go and (laughs) stay at a friend's house it's a bit much now it's quite it's quite crazy got that they all look so innocent because they're not trying to do anything but all loads of souls you know yeah. So that's who he's buried underneath them, basically. Yeah. Where are they going? They're just wandering around. Go off to the toilet, all of them. Off to go and get some steak. Probably go get some steak. Um. The lady leaves the main um, 
uh, paranormal lady, and she says, "Don't worry, though, I'll be back. I'm leaving Ryan here." Yeah, the other mate, he, he's fucking had enough. He pulled Cla- his face off last night. Mister Glasses, Mister Steak is gone. He's yeah. left. <laughs> to, to be fair, you can have more food now. He's gone. Uh, but Ryan's going to stay here, and I will be back, and I'm bringing help. And so she gives, him a, gives her a hug to uh, reassure. Know. They've kind of made a connection. Yeah, and you really feel it as well. Her, it's... She un- obviously, she herself, I think, is possibly a mother, and her kids are grown up or something. She understands what this mother is going through with the loss of her child, and that is the main crux of this, actually. Which is funny, really. We're talking about that, this haunted house movie, whatever. But the whole idea is this a missing girl. Yep. Now, we get a really clever bit here where we realise we've not been we've not been outside of this household and outside of this house for quite some time. But this movie just flies through so much you don't even notice. Well, the reason I say that is because all of a sudden in the morning, Dad's boss shows up. And this is where we realise just the how... The return the living dead. Yeah. And this is where we realise just how bad the dad looks. He says, boss says to him, Jesus, you look like hammered shit, or whatever he says to him. <laughs> and he does, he looks terrible, and he's he not been sleeping. No. And he says to him, we're, we're already worried about you in the office, you know. We can't have my best salesman off of work for two weeks, you know. I've just come to check on you. Let's go for a drive. So he takes him for a drive. Hmm. And uh, he, they drive up to the top of the hill. And he, they talk about the house, you know, and he says, uh, Caroline was born in that house. You know, and he says, ah, well, I want to talk to you about phase five. What do you're you standing. Uh, you're standing on phase five. Here's your bedroom window. I wake up every day and you can look out of here and see this. And basically he says to him, we're going to build here. You can have a house for free if you carry on selling and doing the job that you're doing. Well, while they're talking, they're about two feet away from a big graveyard. It cuts a big wide shot and just right behind them, a huge graveyard with loads of gravestones like sticking out really close together, like really, like, you know, that's a lot. And when said, they said that, it's just a bit like, you knew that if they could uh, not can actually take the bodies, I don't know how you'd get away with that, but just to do that, Willow, would because there's so many would be so much to then put them back in the same job. Oh, it'd be a lot of work, a lot of money that would cost. Well, he says, the boss says to him... H- hence what happens. I'm really sorry that we never made you a partner earlier, but if you take this opportunity, you will become a partner within the company. Um, don't worry about this cemetery. <laughs> we'll just re- relocate it. And he says, what do you mean you'll relocate? He says, ah, we'll just move, We've move them all. We've done it before. What do you mean you've done it before? Uh, your house. What? Your house, you, we built. No way! Thanks for letting oh. me know. Cut to knock on the door. Paranormal ladies arrive back with the help, and it is Zelda Rubinstein as Tangina. She is a memorable character from this, isn't she? I like where the boss says, "Don't worry, it's not an old Native American burial ground or anything." Oh yeah, he says exactly that. what it is. <laughs> You feel a bit, mate. You, bur- you buried. You basically, you built, exactly what it is. You built my house on top of Pet Cemetery, you asshole. Yeah. Um, so Tangina walks in. I've got a very small lady walks into the room. She walks around the house, and she seems to be a mind reader because somebody says, "Well, she's a mind reader." Da, 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 and she no, says, no, no, "I can hear you. No, I just cheers when no, to answer." Let's play it more. I like. I really like this bit. The dad is sceptical already. He's just like, what the fuck? He, I don't know why the dad's sceptical, basically, because his child has gone through a portal into another world. And he's seen ghosts. He shouldn't be sceptical at this point. He should be like, yeah, cool, whatever. But she asks, she goes to the top of the staircase, he says, right at the bottom. She asks him a question. He ignores her. The, his wife and the other doctor woman, who are both kind of teamed up together on this side expected to go with her I was like what are you doing answer her don't be so rude then he kind of explains what he didn't ex- want to do that because he's like oh, I was answering her with my mind and she couldn't hear me and then later on she just fucking pulls his she yanks his chain she pulls it hard and says like I could hear you I just chose not to play games or whatever she says she does say something similar to that. She sits down and talks to mum and says, your daughter, Caroline, is alive in this house somewhere. 
which is reassurance straight away. And she says, the closet is the strongest point of energy. They're all listening to her explaining. And um, she says, this spirit, whatever these spirits are, they want your daughter's life force. Wherever she is, she is the only living thing in that dimension. And they're drawn to her. They want her life force. It reminds them of what they had. Um, it reminds, It's why they want to keep her. And they they all start crying, you know, it's like... She does say, though, that she also senses a terrible presence in there. Yeah, there's a bad presence with her, too. That's and she's good. using Caroline. And that presence is called... The Beast. Splendid. Fucking great. Not the best, but the Beast. And the Beast, apparently, originally, in the original script um, and screenplay, the Beast... supposed to be Satan. No, it was supposed to be a sinister old man, which is why in 2 and 3 you get the sinister old man, who is the Beast. So he's still after her, but that's a form he takes in the second and third movie. Are Um, you saying in Poltergeist 3, then, there's actually... Two characters, because obviously, unfortunately, Caroline died halfway through the third one's being made, and so they had a stand in coming. So, there's two characters in that movie who were not actually the real characters because they had both died. That's crazy. So, Caroline didn't die halfway through, she died when there was only about two scenes left to shoot. Um, oh, okay. The, the end scene being the main one where. But in the, the movie, then, there is actually two characters being played by not the real people in life because they died. Yeah, because he'd That's already weird. died. He'd already died before episode not, three. Not just one, but two. Bloody hell! So they made a mask of him and put yeah. it on an actor. And so same with Karen Ann. They're still standing. So it's a couple of shots. So they say, "Let's go get her. We got to save her from this beast." So they try to make contact, um, and they get a rope. They get some tennis balls. They write one. They write two on each tennis ball. Um, the dad's getting very cross about this. He doesn't understand what they're doing. Um, but they can hear Carol Ann, and they tell her to go to the light. And mum says, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. You just told her, we told her not to go to the light. Now you're telling her to go to the light. What do you mean? So she goes towards the light, and then they say, right, now you've got to run. Run from the light as quick as you can. Um, and they go in the bedroom, and they realize that the portal is in the closet, and Tangina throws a tennis ball into a, into the portal, and downstairs pops out the other end of the portal. Guy slimy ball it. just drops out. Oh, I hate it when my slimy balls drop out. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy catches it, and he says, "It's my writing on it. It's got my handwriting." And then they do the second one. <laughs> my slimy balls are in my hand. <laughs> Tangina throws his slimy balls into the cupboard. Another slimy ball in my hand. Um, so they, this is where they say we've got to throw it into the light, um, and they tie the rope around Mum, don't they? Now, yeah. Dad's going to go in, but Mum says we need someone strong to be able to pull me back through. So you need to stay here. I'm going to go in and get my daughter. It would be the Mum that does it, you know. Mums have that connection, don't they? Um, I'd want to go in, but I, I would lose. Alice would be like, I'm she's, going in the cupboard. She's like, I'm, I will go. And she's like, but you, you, but you haven't done this before either. She says, you go. <laughs> yeah, I know. I really like that. <laughs> I know, she's very funny. But it's, it's a funny moment in... It's a bit of lightness in a terrifying moment, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, so she kisses her husband. This beautiful, beautiful kiss framed by the portal behind them. Again, it's just... Why yeah, is this in it? it works, backlight's it's just, really, looks amazing. Yeah, backlight. And, and, and the colour scheme of it, the backlight and that music score and all the the wind machines. It's like it's Gone just, from gone With the Wind or something, isn't it? It's just this beautiful moment. Your horror version of Gone With the Wind. And then, yeah, Mum steps into the cupboard. Um, and when she walks in, Tangina then starts doing some kind of an exorcism, I guess. And... Uh, Suddenly, all of a sudden, Mum and Carol Ann appear covered in slime. I did, I did. I did notice very quickly here at this point because of my Blu-ray copy. Robbie has a C-3PO light switch. He does in his bedroom on the right by the door. Yeah, That's dope. Yeah, it's a good light switch. That I noticed that. A lot of Star Wars stuff in his bedroom. I'm sure it's Spielberg. A, mainly, reached... it's just a, a lot of the stuff that I've still got at my parents' house, mainly from Empire, actually. Um, 
Yeah, because that would have been the one that was out at this point. Um, yeah, yeah. Spiel, Spielberg obviously gave his buddy George Lucas a call and said, uh, just, just send over a whole ton of merchandise. We need to decorate a kid's bedroom. And he was like, okay, here's a light switch. Here's a Darth Vader head. It's quite cool. So they, they ran the bath before they did this whole thing. And the reason for that is uh, they want to put them straight into a warm bath, get the slime off them. Um, and they are okay. They breathe, breathe, just breathe, just breathe. And they both wake up and they're fine. Um, and then there's a really cute moment with the family together and the paranormal investigators are just watching and then they just close the door because they know this is like a very nice family reunion moment oh yeah totally yeah um just before before they came out that massive demon face that comes out the door fuck it hell yeah the that's huge of, the size of one of them that's well cool really good mm. Tangina then rather prematurely turns around and says ah, this house is clean fuck off is it is it is it though well false ending now because they're moving out mum's got a grey streak it's a bit broader Frankenstein like uh-huh. Yeah, uh, everyone seems really happy. Mum goes up and says, oh, "I'm gonna." It's our last night in the house. I'm gonna dye my hair and have oh, a bath. Quite fancy, the mum. Yeah, it's quite hot. She's all right, isn't she? Yeah. Especially this scene when she gets in the bath. Yeah, yeah. She, so she's dyeing her hair. She gets in the bath and she's chilling out. Robbie and Caroline are playing in the bedroom together. The clang. It hasn't been packed in the boxes for some reason. It's been left on the chair. So he throws a shirt at it to cover it up, but the shirt misses the clown. And later on, he hears a noise, and he thinks, what was that? Oh, shit, the clown isn't in the chair anymore. Why does he even have the fucking clown if he's so scared of it? I'd have put it in the bin by now. Fuck off, leave it in the fucking creepy house that you just come from. Stay there, creeping away with the creepy house. Aren't they still in the creepy house? Isn't this their last night? No, they've moved, haven't they? No, this is them moving out, I believe. No, I thought they'd already moved out. That was them packing. No, that, that's why everything's getting put in the van. Oh, OK. And and then she says to her daughter... Still get rid of that doll, though. Are you sure you're going to be OK staying at the hotel? And she's like, oh, I know that hotel. <laughs> OK, cool. And her mum's like, what do you mean you know that hotel? Who have you been staying there with? Oh, I miss that Cheeky. Cheeky. Anyway, back to the client. The client isn't in the chair, so he. We get this double bluff where you look under the bed. <laughs> What's going on with their bathtub? It's the smallest bathtub in the world. She can't be that tall, and she's got her knees right out of it because it's hot. This is what you notice in the middle of the client section. You notice I, I how notice small the small bathtub was. <laughs> I'm so old. I'm so old now. I'm just like, well, that bathtub this is like when rubbish. I was rubbish. This is like when I was trying to explain how beautiful the family dynamic has been portrayed, and you're going, yeah, but I, I didn't get why we didn't see that alien poster sooner. It's just weird. <laughs> I, I tell you, Larry Dolphin and Kirby. I didn't get a show. I'm fucking living my own Kirby enthusiasm. <laughs> Anyway, the client eventually pops out, starts strangling Robbie. Mum starts getting molested uh, in the bedroom. She gets dragged up the wall. She goes into the Breakdance 2 electric boogaloo room. Doesn't she was in Breakdance 1 or the Nightmare on Elm Street room? It's a, yeah, I'd say the Nightmare on Elm Street room. Um, I think it was also the Breakdance room as well. And she gets dragged up the wall, across the ceiling. Meanwhile, Robbie's fighting the client. I hate that stupid clown! And he starts, like, really busted it up. Good for him. Uh... The cupboard is... Well, I never thought I'd write this down in the podcast notes. Cupboard is active again. <laughs> but the no. cupboard is active again. It's act, it activates again, and the door gets sealed with slime so that no one can get into the bedroom. Mm. There's this big old creature coming out of it, isn't there? Yeah, it's not letting mum in. It's very Ghostbusters again, like. Same, um, same very same sort of era, though, really, isn't it? Very close to each other. She falls down the stairs. Uh, she falls all the way out of the house into the swimming pool. I don't know how she falls in that swimming pool. How does that happen? I don't know. She's she did a clumsy. terrible job there, didn't she? She just goes to get the neighbours some help for neighbours and somehow falls in the swimming pool. And the neighbours do eventually come to help her. After, though, the real-life skeletons have uh, tried attacking her. <sighs> Such a weird point here that it's actually real-life skeletons because they're cheap. Not at all. Cheaper. Not at all. Yeah, it's not at all though because they've always used real skeletons in movies. I guess right it's back to I know. 
Bride of Frankenstein, they use them. They've used it in even in Indiana Jones movies. They always use them, and they're always Indian skeletons because they can get them really cheap from India. But even if you go into a university or a doctor's surgery and you see a skeleton hanging out, it's real because it's so much cheaper than recreating a fake skeleton. Um, and these people, these are people that usually would have donated their body to science or the arts. Um, okay, so that makes it makes me feel a bit better about it. So, for the record, it is real skeletons uh, in the swimming pool, um, but it wasn't ancient. They weren't told American. they were they. No, they weren't. No. <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty terrifying seeing so all these skeletons start popping up in the swimming pool. Coffins pop up with horrible faces popping out of them. Jewels. Put it in my will. My skeleton is used in movies. Yeah. Okay. I'm any up for that. any particular franchise? Uh, 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 necro, necro, porn. <laughs> I can't help. <laughs> so you'll always have a boner. Guess so. Dan yeah. Bone. Yeah. Well, you're not using my skeleton for anything. So I'm getting cremated. <laughs> no one uses your skeleton for anything. So you can smoke my ashes if you want. Yeah. All right. That's my request. Is you, ro- you roll up some of my ashes and smoke it like in that Method Man film. Better give me a head rush. Is that how high? Is that what that's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really disgusting. Good, it is, and they've got really good corpse they carry along. But it's like, I was, remember watching that one and going, this is the weirdest movie I've ever seen. I, th- I thought the same thing, and I was stoned when I watched it, so I thought it would add to it. But I was like, this is Not weird. Not yeah. Why are Method Man and Red Man smoking their buddies' ashes it's so, so they can get really clever at maths? <laughs> they must have been so high when they came up with that. Uh, of course. It's Method Man and Red Man. How do they sell that to people? Do they go, yeah, let's spend our time and resources on this? Weird. I love it. I love it when Red, Red Man just turns up in that Chucky movie and starts um, getting on, getting on with Jennifer Tilly. <laughs> really? It's like what is happening? Is it I know. Man or Red Man. Red Man. Red Actually, Red. I don't think it's Jennifer Tilly. I think it's Hannah from S Club Seven that he gets on with. Really weird. Red Man's never really in movies. Method Man does loads of shit, but you know he's a bit like Ice T with the amount of stuff he does. I love Red Man. It's my favourite rapper of all time. Um, anyway, she makes her way back out of the pool, back to the bedroom. She grabs Robbie and says, "Grab your sister," and they form like a human well, chain. The neighbour pulls her out of the pool, and she and like the neighbour just goes down and says, "Ah!" And she's like, "Help me, my children!" Runs in, and he's like, "Nah." I would run in and help her. I'd run in as well. Go, what's going on? Like, I'll help you. Yeah. But he wants to go back inside and watch um, Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood with Mr. Rogers. Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood. Beautiful Day for a Neighbour. Could you, you be mine? mine? Could you, you be mine? mine? My neighbour. Reminds me of the Burbs as well, because he's watching that. Yeah. Drinking an orange juice in the bed. Oh, I need to watch that again soon at some point. Anyway, she grabs Robbie and says, grab your sister, and they form a human chain, and they slowly get pulled out of the bedroom. Safe. Dad gets home just in time for this absolute shit show that's going on just before when she runs up to it when she sees the corridor we have oh so lovely the way this has been done is so nice we have basically the jaw shot is the best way to do it when you when it's the camera's uh, pushed oh, forward yeah. and the, the zoom is pulled back or the push other, pull or, yeah or the other way around whichever way you want to do it you can do it make it to look different ways so as she goes, oh, my God, I've got to get to that corridor, she starts to run down it. Oh, it's over her head looking down the corridor. So with a, co- a wide lens anyway, makes the corridor look quite long. But when they pull that as well, it makes the corridor go really long, making her journey longer, making it almost like, oh, my God. And in her mind, it must be, it works on so many levels. Just that one shot, it's very good. Well, Dad gets home, like I say, and as he gets home, he sees all these strange lights coming out of the house, and you can see him think, oh, Jesus Christ, not <laughs> again. He's, he's, him and Gabriel Byrne need to get down that glory hole. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. Um, uh, so he goes in the house, and as he walks in, just to make things worse, all these coffins start bursting out of the kitchen floor. Just out on the front porch, just Bo- there on the front door. Bodies are flopping out of them. The coffin, the coffin vertically comes up. It's like an Indiana Jones scene. It's just everywhere there's yeah. a skeleton. Everywhere you turn, there's a skeleton. There's a skeleton. Ah! Um, you son of a bitch. You only moved the headstones. You didn't yeah. move the bodies. 
so they all run away and get in the car and there's quite a comical moment where they're just about to start speeding off a body lands on the top of the car and what does the boss must be thinking like oh i'm not gonna sell any more houses around here yeah a body just appears on the on the front and then dana gets out of the car the daughter and she's like what's going on and they just all go she just freaks out get in the car <laughs> they just scream at her and she's like okay she just jumps in the car the whole neighbourhood at this point is watching. It's very burbs again. It is. The whole neighbourhood has come out. Um, and there's a question I've got for you at the end. But remember that, what I've said here. Does the whole the house, neighbourhood. Does the house now like go into little vortex with evil dead? Like, like what the fuck? Well, it implodes on itself into yeah. nothing. Yeah. Uh, while the boss watches it. And they go to a Holiday Inn. Hotel, check in. motel. Holiday Inn. If your girl starts acting up. Then you take her friend. Don't condone that, by the way, guys. That is an old hip-hop lyric and very misogynistic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and a funny moment here where they check into the Holiday Inn and then the camera stays outside and then all of a sudden Dad just kicks the TV out into the... <laughs> it's raining, but he doesn't care. He boots it out onto the and hallway. Just slowly put away from that shot. And I want to ask you... <clears throat> and then right at the top, the first credit comes up, right at the top, first thing... Steven Spielberg production. Yep. Do any of his other movies, first thing as it comes up, say, like, you know, if it was not directed by him, Steven Spielberg production. I bet it doesn't. But what I want to ask you, so that was the movie, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up properly in a moment, but very quickly... Also, another thing, very, very, very quickly, just wait. Just then the credits come up. At one point, some of the credits are just normal credits, so at some point, they come in three levels, credit, 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 steps... Right. I don't know why. <laughs> it's oh, really, I thought you were going to... No, it's really weird. I don't know why it happens. Just credits come down, and all of a sudden there's some broken up credits of steps, then some more, then steps. And it's like, well, what's going on here? Sorry, it's just weird things that I noticed because I'm like that. What are you going well, to ask me? My question to you is, <clears throat> the entire neighbourhood have come out, right? So, yeah, okay, we can explain away what happened earlier with the twister. How have the entire neighbourhood witnessed a house they, vanish into a vortex with bodies popping out of the floor everywhere? How, what are they going to, when the police turn up and say, where's the house gone that was here? Where are the family gone? We need to interview them about all these strange noises and disturbances. How are they going to explain? Oh, well, what happened was the house just sort of sucked itself in, inside out into a vortex. I'm not sure. Nowadays, they'd put everybody out of it on video. What you need is the men in black to turn up and do their little beep, beep. Mind, mind wipe thing. Yeah. Um, and then we finish with the goal, Jerry Goldsmith's uh, score. I've got it on violent, actually. Well, I remember you mixing it into one of our um, Halloween... Um, for, uh, music mixes we did for an episode once. Speaking of which, this year I will be doing, going back to doing a Halloween mix again because now I've got my digital turntables, I can really I can mix up loads of stuff that I don't have on record. So... <clears throat> However, due to copywriting, we won't be allowed to release that on normal platforms. It'll be on Patreon. Uh, only patrons will get that. Mm. Sorry, guys, but we used to have a music segment years ago where we would pick a song yeah. related to or from the movies we're covering, but actually that, those get flagged became, up on YouTube and Spotify now. Yeah. Well, well, originally I wanted to make uh, this podcast like a radio show, uh, kind of in a way, you know? Mm. Um, anyway, yes, love this movie. So, let, yes, let's wrap it up. So, wow, wowie, wowie, what a ride. Um, and the what... second one, I really like too. Yeah, I really like the second one. I need to watch the third one. Third one, in my opinion, is still great. I really like the whole... Oh, okay. I've got it on um, VHS. Weirdly, it was the only one that was on Netflix for years. Just Portal Guys 3. Just number three. That was it. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's because it was... Yeah. And it's Tragic 3 because that was the one that she... You can tell she's very ill because her face was very puffy all the way through it. Um, And then they remade it. And fuck me, that was a waste of time that remake even uh, Sam Rockwell dissed it on live like, interview um, yeah it's a really shame at, uh, with Carol Ann because she's misdiagnosed yeah which was the worst thing you know 
Um, very cute, very cute little girl. Um, very sad. Shame. But but left. But you know, to be honest, it, she left left us this character in the movie. And yeah. we, we praised her to this evening. She'll so. always always be remembered as cute Absolutely. little Caroline. And she is she is the face of Poltergeist. You know, um, and she'll always be remembered. So um, rest in peace. Indeed. Rest in peace. So everybody that died on the set of this or, or involved with it, because there's about six people that died. Um, but yeah, that was Poltergeist. So <clears throat> amazing. Thumbs up. A big thumbs up, obviously. gets a. I think I give this a nine. Uh, it's an almost perfect movie. It's probably a film gods movie, actually. It's, it is definitely in there. I could quite happily watch this <laughs> any time of the day, really. Um, great, great film. Thank you for letting us review these films. Yeah, thanks, Don. Amazing um, choices there, my friend, and I hope that we did them proud for you. Um, highly recommend both of them, and they're both parallel, like like we said, both about families dealing with loss, uh, both go in different directions. One is very dark, and one is scary, but a bit lighter, with a bit of a happier ending. <laughs> um, Gav, should we get that F out of here and come back to a little outro time. I guess that could be like the two glory holes, couldn't it? What? Get the F out? No one's ter- terrifying or scary. The other one's a bit more happier. And you, and you don't know which is which. <laughs> the choice is yours, my friend. Stick it in. See what you've, got, you've got Grace Jones as the vamp behind one of them and you've got the mum from Bottle Geist behind the other one. And you don't know who's who. Good luck. Right, let's get out and wrap this up. Cool, so there we go. That was episode 131, another patron pick uh, with Don Collier picking uh, Hereditary and Poltergeist. Fantastic movie. Oh, hang on a minute. What? I've just had another email come in from Don. Wow. Okay. Okay, okay. Ah, I'm going to read this out. Here we go. You you ready for me to read this out, Gav? You, you go for it. Okay. Uh, so, say, hey, Dan and Gav. I just wanted to check in and say that I'm really looking forward to my episode coming up next. Uh, I just listened to Gav's birthday episode, and I wanted to thank you for introducing me to the Horror Express. Oh. I'd never heard of it, but never watched it, and never watched it until your episode. Oh, I'd heard of it. I was going to never... say, never heard of it, you must have heard of it. But I'd never watched it it's until your name. episode reminded me of it. It was a pleasant surprise, and I also wanted to make sure that my last email got to you, etc., on time. Uh, I hope my intros for the movies are fine. Please let me know. They, are, they were fine. They worked really well. Thank you ever so much. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention Jimmy Savile. I would hear you guys mention this name a lot, and I'd heard of him, but I've never pictured who he was. Well, cut to early this year when Netflix dropped its mini docu-series on him, and it brought so much back to me from my childhood. Wow, that sounds bad considering the subject matter, but I've realised I've seen this guy on the news all the while growing up and never knew who he was. They would show him wearing a beret and a kilt and walking around looking important. I always thought he was a leader of the British military or a royal. Um, yeah. So Don, Don's obviously living in the US. That, that's funny uh, to hear that perspective of Jimmy exactly. Savile. Yeah. Uh, it blew my mind to find out that he was a paedophile re- radio DJ. Anyway, I just Not, had to share that. that. That's that's saying it mildly. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, I just had to share that because this guy brought back so much nostalgia of watching the, the evening news with my parents and finding out his true story has just been crazy. Okay, had to share that. Wow. Thanks. Thanks again for all your great material. Looking forward to my episode. Your pal, Don, a.k.a. Donnie Darko from Donnie Darko's Fine Footage Horror Movie Podcast. So there you go, guys. If you want to check out Donnie's podcast, it's called Donnie Darko's Fine Footage Horror Movie Podcast. He did say he's been on a bit of a hiatus for a year or so, so he hasn't had any more recent episodes, but there are episodes out there if you want to go check it out. Donnie, Don, Donnie Darko, my friend, we salute you. Thank you so much. I literally saluted then, Gav. You did. I don't know why I did that. But also, hilarious that you didn't know who Jimmy Savile was and then... If you don't know, if you're non-UK and don't know uh, who that is, um, feel free to have a deep dive. But I covered him actually on um, a High Strangers podcast where I do have my lovely lady plug for that. Um, You can listen to all about it. And I actually 
physically felt sick on the podcast and actually for a moment thought I was going to have to stop and be sick which is something I've never done before um, but because that guy is particularly sickening yeah he's an evil piece of shit yeah. uh, not a rest in peace a burning fuck land wow burning fuck land yeah there we go well that was episode 131 thank you again to Don our patron what is coming up next shall we look at that Gav the next three episodes show me Oh, wow. Episode 132 is going to be a love session. Oh, sexy. It's our Valentine special, our annual Valentine special. We <laughs> have chosen the heartthrob Christian Slater <laughs> and two of his movies. We're going to be covering very bad things. Which is, which is about romance and a honeymoon. It is. No, it's well, a stag do. It's a stag do, but it, it of marriage, which is love. But it's going to be his relationship with his wife Cameron Diaz. So that'll be our first Cameron Diaz on the on the show. Yeah. Um, and we'll be pairing that up with the classic, gritty, bloody, sweary, true romance. I know. And in that massive Blu-ray poll I've got recently, there's a Blu-ray copy of that, so I've got that. Can't wait. Possibly Christian Slater's best role. I've not seen that movie for many years because I had it on DVD. And for the early years of when DVDs first came out, you only had a few of them. I had Me and the Dragon and stuff. True Romance was one of them. And I watched it multiple times. So I've not seen it for many years because I'd kind of got bored of it. You know. Um, yeah. But it's a fucking... That Christopher Walken scene in the caravan. Yeah, with Christopher... With um, Dennis Hopper. Is just... <laughs> incredible and we won't even be able to repeat the majority of the dialogue <laughs> from that scene no we can't um episode 133 after that will be our women in horror month special so february is women in horror month and we're going to be covering two ass-kicking female-led movies um the hunt from 2020 it's a relatively new movie three years old i really like that Really like that one. Uh, and, Shudder, isn't it? Uh, I think it is Shudder, yeah. And also, You're Next from 2011. Oh, uh, me? You're Next, Gav. Me? Yeah. From 2011. <laughs> what? That doesn't make sense, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you're Next. I actually... Did I watch... Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I'm getting it muddled up in my head. I'm getting a mix up of both of those films in my head because I watched that film with the bride on the games night and the game they choose is to hunt her and truth her. or dare no oh um hide and seek hide and, hide and seek is that it yeah. no i know i know the one you mean um what's it called i know the one you mean it's a bit like it's on disney yeah i know i, I know watch it on dvd for now yeah, anyway that one that sounds like that okay cool what's the third third episode well, that'll be another patron pick, and I'm not going to reveal those yet. But I can do, I suppose. Oh, can yeah. do, yeah. Okay, it's going to be uh, The Changeling. Oh, George Hitchcock. Yeah, paired up with Legacy. I don't know. Is that that Tom Cruise movie where he's got a funny horn on his head? No, that's Legend. Oh, I don't know what Legacy is. Well, we will discover more when we get to that episode. All right, all right. Fine. So if you are the patron that picked those and you know who you are, we will give you more of a shout out as we get closer to the time. But they are locked in, Mr. Patron. Oh, give it away. It's a man. Um, <laughs> and yes, we, we've we got you locked in for that episode. So don't you worry. So we'll talk to you more. I'll contact you soon about your your email and your paragraphs of why you've chosen these. I'm very excited, especially to cover the changed in. Oh my God, it's going to be so good. Uh, it's one of my favourite. It's possibly my favourite Haunted House movie. Wow. Good choice then. Mm. Brilliant. Well, that's the next three episodes. <sighs> Incredible stuff. We, we're tearing through these episodes, through these films. I'm having a blast. Mm. We are in our 10th year of podcasting and we are just... Weird. Just getting better with age, aren't we? Yeah. Weird. Or like a fine wine or an old cheese. Yeah. Well, I'll do some admin and then we can say our goodbyes. Okay, man. Okay. Well, we are, obviously, 
the podcast on Haunted Hill, a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Uh, if you jump onto legionpodcast.com, you can find us and the majority of our old shows and all the other shows that are in the network. Uh, if you want to speak to us, just jump on Facebook search for the podcast on Haunted Hill you can reach out you can chat to me and Gav directly privately or you can just join our community of weirdos uh, where we've got a little family on there that's been going for almost 10 years like we say and you know I feel like some of these guys are some old friends now and some of them I probably never and will ever never meet but in the flesh at least um, fantastic place to sort of chat and stay on top of what we're covering and who's watching what and trailers and everything else that's going on in the world of horror and, and film generally. Um, there's also a, a Legion podcast Facebook page as well, and uh, that's sort of a more general for all the shows to join in. Most shows have their own separate pages as well. Uh, we can also email us directly at uh, the podcast on Haunted Hill at outlook.com. That's our email address. Let us know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you want to hear, you know, suggestions, anything really. Um, anything dodgy, I'll send Gab's way, uh, as always. Um, and then we're available in most places where you can hear podcasts, wherever you listen to us now, but also Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, Podcast Addict, Podbean, all the usual places. Please, if you're able to like us or rate us, do so uh, or give us a review um it all helps us sort of get our profile up a little bit really appreciate anyone who does that we're on twitter at haunted podcast we're on instagram the podcast on haunted hill insta uh, we mentioned our star wars fan film that is kicking off soon um that's through our little production company deadbolt films uh, you can find out more about that on deadboltfilms.com yeah. um, all of our shorts uh, comics uh, features podcasts things that we've done and produced and etc over the years uh, there's lots to see and do on there uh, deadbolt films is on instagram as well just deadbolt films and it's on twitter at deadbolt films uh, and finally um patron for anybody that would like to become a patron just search for the podcast on haunted hill on patreon or ask me if you're not if you can't find the link i'll send you the link it's easy peasy uh, but you don't have to do it we never ask anyone to do it but if you do want to become a patron and even donate as little as a pound or a dollar a, a month you can do so it all really really genuinely helps um to pay for equipment we're about to replace it quite a major piece of equipment actually um so you know it even goes towards the cost of renting or buying some more obscure films that we can't always stream in the usual places so if you want to do that, we, we really appreciate it, but we never beg or ask anybody to do it. It's just honestly amazing, if, even if you want to hear us, let alone give us a bit of money. So well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Um, thank you to all of our patrons. As always, you will get a name check. Yep. Um, especially, though, this this episode, especially to Don Collier. And it's a Patreon uh, episode. With his crown on. Thank you very much, King Don. Uh, but also thank you to Matthew Godley, Jamie Jenkins, Kevin S. Fife. Uh, Sarah Kay, Rachel, RJ McCready, and Lex Boo. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much patrons. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everybody, as always, for listening, for supporting, for liking, for commenting, and just generally hanging out with me and Gav over the years. And Gav, thank you to you. For thank you to you. Being a sexy man on the other side of a glory hole. You too. With Gabriel Byrne. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so that's that's everything it's a good night from gabriel burns uh, glory hole of course it's a good night from a oh god it's a good night from uh, tangina who i'm gonna hire as my cleaning lady just Is so she... that when she's fi... yep just so when she's finished she can say this house is clean <laughs> And I'll go, hang on, you missed a spot. There's a hole in the ceiling with slimy objects coming out of it. My slimy balls! My slimy balls are dropping into my hands. <laughs> yeah, it's a good night from me. And it's a good night from you. Take care. Make sure those doors and windows are locked and your holes are all <laughs> closed. Glory. Up. And make sure there's no bloody clown toys under your bed. Because yeah. if there is... Throw them in the vortex. Stay safe. Goodbye. Good, good night. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We will be back again real soon.